Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tom Cox, and I have the pleasure of being the president of the Genesee Community College Foundation. I would like to welcome you to Genesee Community College and to the Wilcott J. Humphrey Symposium on Leadership and Community Life. The Wilcott J. Humphrey III Symposium is an event sponsored by GCC, which features distinguished speakers who bring the best of the world's cutting edge ideas on leadership to Western New York's civic, business, and professional community. More importantly, the event provides participants with tangible ideas and techniques that they can use to build their organization and their communities. I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the Humphrey family, especially Mary Humphrey and Peter Humphrey, for establishing the Wilcott J. Humphrey Symposium as a permanent memorial to Jay's life and ideals. I would also like to acknowledge several honored guests attending this afternoon and morning. Members of the College Board of Trustees who are here, members of the Foundation Board of Directors, GCC College business students, and members of the 2022 Humphrey Symposium Committee. And also I would be remiss if I didn't thank our GCC Foundation staff who does a tremendous amount of the heavy lifting for these events. To begin this morning's program, I would like to introduce Jay Gsell, the 2022 Humphrey Symposium Committee member who will emcee today's event and introduce our keynote speaker. Jay. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jay Gazelle. I was the county manager here for 27 years. The Altamares can uh, identify with that in terms of what I put them through as the budget officer also. So, and as did President Sunser um, and Stu Steiner beforehand as to how we could get nickels to turn to dimes and quarters um, even though you know, alchemy was not something that was taught at the community college. But maybe there's an opportunity some there sometime in the future. So as, as, as Tom indicated, um, you know, this is, I think this is our ninth actual uh, Humphrey Symposium. Uh, we had a two-year hiatus. Understand that we also spent almost the last year literally um, putting this together, getting the right fit with our panelists as well as with the theme. Um, also, there's about 168 people who registered today, uh, which is a good thing because that was one of the things we were concerned about, you know, with the regulations and the COVID uh, masking, unmasking, vaccinations, things of that nature. So at least for here today, we've escaped and are in that sort of cocoon of, of not having to worry about that. But by the same token, um, you know, the reason, as Tom indicated, that we are here really is the impetus uh, of Jay Humphrey, um, a, a good friend and a colleague. Um, when, unfortunately, at 53, he did not uh, step forward with us, was not able to step forward with us. But it's his legacy and his impetus and his motivation that moved this county forward in so many different ways. Um, comprehensive plan, what this college represents, uh, what he and the family have committed to financially, but also theoretically and programmatically, uh, you know, to this educational institution. Um, and the fact that we represent a four low county region um, with that education opportunity. Um, one of the things also you'll see today um, is that, you know, this is all dedicated to the idea of what we can do here locally. As they say, think globally, act, act, act locally. Um, also in terms of uh, every day, you know, even as, as now retired, um, and I can tell you, those who are in the state retirement system, that your DiNapoli money does show up on a monthly basis, interestingly, um, as does Social Security, so that's a good thing. Um, is that also, uh, you know, what we're doing in this community, the growth and the opportunities that we have is because of what's going on here, but also the people, you know, in this community in general. It's a, it takes a village, and I think we truly in Genesee County and in the region um, are reflective of that. Also that in terms of why we're doing this um, and why we even pick the theme that we have, um, it's what's relevant to us, what's relevant to our future. Jay's impetus was always, what's the future hold? Um, and it was always a matter of, don't look over your shoulder, go forward and see what it is you need to do in the future, be prepared, um, and also make sure that you put the right players in the right place. And I know a number of you here in this room work with Jay and, we're, and are very familiar with the Humphrey family. Um, I'm a newcomer, I came out of Iowa slash New Jersey, so as Joe Gerace used to call me, I'm an interloper, sort of a carpetbagger. Um, but, you know, hopefully after 28 years, if he were still alive, he'd finally bless me at least be able to stay for a few more years. Um, but that was, just, that was just what's going on in the community. Um, in addition to Jay's uh, legacy uh, and the Humphrey family, um, also Rick Ensman, the former, uh, uh, shall we say, administrator of the foundation, Tom's predecessor. Um, also Dr. Stu Steiner, as, as well as John Dwyer, 
Uh, again, people who have always made sure that the impetus and the finances for even to do something like this were available uh, and that we could carry this forward and can continue to do this. Uh, you'll notice in the program in the back, um, there's a page here that indicates, for those who are not familiar, who the previous presenters were uh, for this day. Um, quite a diverse and eclectic group of, of individuals. Um, and they were all very, very, um, shall I say, um, encouraged and enthusiastic when they got here about what we're doing and how unique we are in many ways. Um, but also, um, also if I may, and I kind of glossed over this, those of you who have one of these suckers somewhere on your person, please put it either on silence or turn it off so we don't have anybody running out of here. Um, since there's no POTUS here, I don't think we have to worry about someone being that important um, that they have to have their cell phone, uh, you know, singing their song or doing whatever. Mine happens to be a Jeff Beck tune, so we don't, you don't want to hear that. Um, by the same token, this steering committee, which as I indicated, has been meeting for about the last a little over a year um, with the, under the chairmanship of Nathan Rogers, who is here today. Um, I'd like that whole committee, all those representatives, to please stand up uh, who are here in the room, uh, that you, if you've been on the committee, and help put this, uh, this event together. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Also, uh, in terms of our initial SUS keynote, uh, this morning we have Peter Boyd here to talk about climate change and sustainability, which is our theme. During our planning for the symposium over the last year, we purposely picked the date, <coughs> excuse me, of the event being near Earth Day, which is tomorrow. Uh, also, we talk a lot about leadership, good business practices, balancing community involvement, with the very real need to focus on continuity, continually, I'm sorry, continually growing, changing, and improving our local businesses. I say our local businesses because in a community, the businesses, the schools, the service organizations, and our future workforce are all intertwined and interdependent. Balancing these forces leads to a healthy, <coughs> excuse me, economy and healthy businesses. Peter has found that balance. He drove his electric vehicle here, his Tesla 3, I believe it is, um, and plugged it in, or hopefully can plug it in here at the charging stations we have here on campus. Um, and again, he took the, shall we say, more scenic route getting here, um, and which I, we gotta give him a lot of credit for doing that, because he's from downstate slash Westport, Connecticut area. You know, it's a little bit more metropolitan than we are up here. But also, I'm gonna let him talk about what else he brings to this table today. Um, also, um, he is, his principal, as you'll see in the slideshow, um, is the Time for Good group, um, as well as the other affiliations and industry development and sustainability programs uh, that he's put in practice as being part of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, as well as the CEO and founder of the Time for Good group. He's, I'm, and I, I wax poetic only in terms of education, he's an Oxford graduate because he comes from uh, the Scottish side of the British Isles, uh, with honors no less uh, in, in the things that he is actually doing today. Uh, those were his specialties and his concentrations academically. Um, he also sort of has hung out with Richard Branson, not too, uh, you know, insignificant. Um, and so, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Boyd. Good morning, everybody. Sounds okay? You can hear me in the back? Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome. And good luck with my accent. Um, excellent. So um, I'm going to switch on here and, and, get, and get going. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a great drive here. Um, you, uh, this, is, this is the title, which I tweaked slightly as, as, I, as I was driving up. I thought, I said, let's think, as you say, global and local is the challenge. So, and it, it's not just global warming. It's not just climate change. It's a climate crisis we're in. So addressing the global climate crisis, our narrow and closing, but still open window of huge opportunity. That's the, the title that I want to sort of address more specifically today. And it's also every single one of us in this room has that window of opportunity. And that's what I want to try and get across um, today. You may have noticed the attire, uh, sli slightly different. I want to make a slightly more serious point at the end, but I, I, I just wanted to um, dress up for the occasion. Um, I got this when I was 18. 
um, is my surname, and I heard that you've got a Genesee um, registered tartan sitting there in the president's office as well. So, and quite a few sort of Scottish uh, connections um, as I drove through Caledonia and other places on the way here. Um, I also wanted to channel my Angelo's quote here that you're probably going to forget just about everything I, I, I say. Um, hopefully, I try and make you feel something different, um, but you might not forget so easily how I looked at the time. Um, so, so that's what we want to do. Um, and as I say, really nice to be here uh, today um, and sort of driving through, seeing there's a Celtic fair on in a month just around the corner. Um, I, I drove through Caledonia, which is the Latin word for Scotland. There's even a little Scottish flag um, of, uh, of contrails um, just at the end of the street there. Um, so really excited to be here and be an outsider, but such a, uh, feel like such a welcome outsider here today uh, with, with you all. Um, Talk, talking of that, um, you know, sort of, I'm an outsider. There's Caledonia as I drove through, and we're sitting here on these lands um, on the Seneca people. Um, and just to say, like, you know, it's, it's just humbling to know that this land has been sort of stewarded for so many hundreds of years, and, and I, I've just seen it for the first time as I drove through yesterday. Um, before I tell you too much of my story, and um, is there any bombs going off there, I'll keep my chin clear. Um, before I tell you too much of my story, it'd be great to find out a bit more about you. So I know that it's fantastic, uh, the, 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 the event here, and for those online, if you can grab a pen, a pen and paper, um, think, if you can, on these four questions, if, if you can. That would be great. So how concerned are you about, about climate change and this um, climate, climate crisis? And if you can think of A, super concerned, um, to F, not concerned at all. So write a letter down if you can in your, in, on, on your piece of paper. And I know you, you've all got nice posh notepads here, fresh for the, for, fresh for the occasion. Um, how optimistic are you that we can solve this? Um, with four being very optimistic, down to one being not very optimistic. And one word, if you can, to say, what do you want to get out of this symposium, listening to me and listening to a fantastic panel that, that, will, be, that will be following? What, why, why did you register? And then the last one word is, what might you want to do differently, even better, to lead after the symposium? Um, I'm, I'm driving 368 miles here that, so people change and do something different afterwards. It's not a, hopefully, a workshop symposium. They go, that was nice, and nothing changes. I want you all to go away with doing something differently, um, having listened to me and, 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 the lo and the local panel. So if you can have a quick think about that, and then, since I've got a little bit of time, I want you to take less than two minutes to compare your two scores, your letter and your number, and your two words with your neighbor. If you can turn left, right, back, front to somebody you, you know least, and I'll just let you chat. And online, if you can find somebody. Go for it. Okay, everybody, everybody compared their score. They've got a letter in their head. They've got, a, they've got a number in their head. Great. Back in the room. Okay, we're going to try something interactive here. And this includes people joining us from home, because this works. So hopefully, you listen to Jay on just half of his instructions. Your phone is on silent, but not completely off. Um, so if you can dig out your cell phone, this is a place in um, our morning where cell phones are encouraged uh, and not discouraged. If you can text the word void to 22333, then you'll get a text back, hopefully, and then you can talk to the screen and vote. I'm encouraged by a lot, a, a, some younger people grabbing their phone immediately. They know how to do this. Um, I'm also encouraged by some older people smiling and saying, I will try this. Um, there we go. Our first vote's up there. So 
This is the answer to the first question on the A to F. If you were to place yourself in, in one of the six Americas, from alarmed to dismissive, you also have an extra option G for me here. Um, where would you be on climate change? It is fantastic to see that disengaged people have come here to listen. So that I am super excited about the, the, the Ds um, and the cautious. You normally get in a climate change conference, obviously, the A's and the B's. Um, but great to see a spread. And also great to see no E's and F's either. Thank you, everybody. Just a quick one. To the extent you think that's interesting, um, I will be screen grabbing everything you see today and getting it onto a website that you can all browse through. Any of my slides, you'll be able to see on a website afterwards. Great. Still voting? Great. We've got over, over 60 votes. Over 60 votes. That sounds like a quorum. Does it cancel? Um, great. So, that actually, so, so the six Americas from A to F actually come from um, the Yale Program of Climate Change Communication. Um, I was just trying to get you to self-declare, um, but there's actually a, a, a thing called a SASE, a super quick survey on the six Americas. So if you wanted to go to that afterwards, you can, see, you can ans answer a survey and see how you compare versus uh, other, other people there. Um, they also dig in by county level. This is a piece I pulled up. This, this report uh, or access to these reports just came out ye yesterday, this week. So this is Genesee County's attitudes on global warming in general. Um, and, and, you know, is it caused by humans, you know, sort of, et cetera? So next question is, was the other one, the, one, the, four, the four numbers. How optimistic are you um, that we can solve this as a world, as a whole world? And I loved how Jay set this up as a global and a local problem. All to totally anonymous. I don't think any professors are going to get into the back end of this and email you. Um, excellent. So good spread and leaning optimistic. I'll wait for a few more votes to come in. There's just 30 there. Get a few, few more cell phones out. That's a good spread. OK. We're leaning pessimistic as the slower voters come in. OK? Um, and what about this community? How, about, how, about, how optimistic can we solve it here in Genesee County? Great. More optimistic, hopefully more sense of control. Sense that we can do this. And then I asked you two, two words, but I'm only going to ask one for here. What's that one word about what you want to get out of the symposium, my talk and the, and, and the panel to follow? You can put a word, inspiration, OK. And if you like a word you see there, you can text it, text it to the screen, too, and the word will get bigger. So already, knowledge is something that people want. That's what they came for, ideas. Nobody's worked out yet that emojis are also allowed in. I'll wait for the first emoji to appear because it looks better. There we go. Excellent. So knowledge, ideas, inspiration. OK. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think myself and the panel, we have our work cut out for us. Great. And for the last one about your, about your um, involvement, what you're going to do differently when you leave, um, I want to sort of park that question to the end, if I may, because hopefully my talk will help with that. And, and obviously, you, you're thinking. You've come here for that. So keep your notes handy, your notebook handy. Jot down those words, those ideas, the, the things that you might do differently, and the things you might lead. So just to, to answer back to me, a bit more about me, I, uh, if I answer those questions too, A, I'm alarmed. Um, and I was so, sort of so thank you to Ante, Anthony Lacerowitz and the whole team at the Yale Program for Climate Communication. Um, that's, they lead the Six Americas study. 
um, and, and amongst others. Maybe if I stand back, there might be, it might be a, a, a speaker issue there. Um, the, the second answer, uh, I'm a three. Um, I love this phrase from Christiana Figueres. Uh, she called it, uh, I'm a stubborn optimist. Uh, that means it's, it's both the, the kind of wide, eye, wide ra radar, let's look at what we've got and what we need to fix, but let's be absolutely optimistic that we can get there and keep pushing and, 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 go, and go for the solutions. And so thank you to her for that phrase. It's a great one to Google. Um, on, 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 she's got some good TED Talks, but also for the inspiration in general and shepherding the Paris Agreement through. That was her, her big role in 2015. Um, so in terms of what I, I would like to bring to you, um, and hopefully this matched that, that, that word cloud, some ideas. I want to throw quite a lot of ideas at you. Most of them you can find on the, on the internet. It's not new for me necessarily. I'm shepherding them through for you, collecting them. Um, some will resonate and you can go off and research. Some will not, just ignore them. Um, but what I want to get across is the simplicity of the problem and the complexity of the solutions. But also, uh, that there's a good word that I saw in that there, the inspiration to act and to lead on both a big global level and hopefully a small, very local here level as well. Um, in terms of my bio, it's, it's, it's far too long on the inside cover, so I won't go into this. Suffice to say that I, I've kind of gone across different sectors over time. I'm always being fascinated about leadership and what makes good leaders great, and then also um, how do we get to a sustainable world. And so that's the kind of the meandering career path and the, and, and the involvement I've got both in and out of Yale and, and coaching and consulting now. Um, so it's really just one perspective that I want to give you today. I'm not trying to sort of be com comprehensive, especially when we've got such a great um, set of skills just joining us on the panel afterwards. Um, so it's, but it is a perspective from the global, the national, the regional, and the local. And it's a cross-sector generalist. That's, that's how I declare myself, rather than a deep specialist in any of this. And it's a personal view of what's out there. It's also personal, because I think it's personal to all of you. Um, these are my three kids. Uh, they'll be younger than I am now in 2050, when we've got to have sorted all this stuff. Um, so I think it's one of those sort of seven generations is a beautiful phrase, but now it's here. Now it's now. It's like, you know, many of us will be alive there. Man, many of us will have kids then. It, it's a, and our kids are inheriting this. So it's personal, hopefully, to all of us in the room. So I wanted to address the global climate science crisis through this narrow window, but of huge opportunity in four different ways. I want to give you some big picture slides. I want to give you some thoughts on the solution spaces. Then I want to sort of, sort of give you a little bit about what I'm excited about and what I'm working on, and then close on you in terms of what are you excited about and what are you, what are you working on and what will you work on. Does that sound like a good flow? I want nods. It's still good to have in-person sort of interactions and faces. So uh, I'm too excited after COVID, two years on Zoom. Um, so big picture. I mean, this is the blue marble. This, this photo was taken. It's a super, I think it's the most famous photo of the world ever, taken 10 months before I was born. Um, and just shows us the fragility of the Earth. But it, what it also sh uh, shows, and a, a sort of hat off to, to Neil Yo for finding this for me, and, and NASA photo, is this like, this is it from the side. And, and I think some of us just think of this limit, li limitless expanse of, um, uh, of, of gases and say, like, how can we possibly harm this? But if you actually look at it, that you're like our atmosphere, the air that we breathe, it, if you took the car and instead of driving 368 miles here, I pointed it upwards and drove upwards, it'd only be five to 10 minutes before I reached the top of our atmosphere. So it's only a five to 10 minute drive up there. So the fact that we are putting heat trapping gases in that don't then escape, it hopefully gets to us in these two photos, the idea of the fragility of the Earth and how much we are actually doing as a human race to do it and how much we can do to solve it as well. Um, the, the, going on this idea of the big picture, I love these things. That, again, you can all find them on the internet. This one, if you Google climate spiral, you find this. This is the world's temperatures over, sort of since the Industrial Revolution spiraling towards the safe thresholds or outside the safe thresholds of one and a half and two degrees. 17 of the 18 hottest years, as it says there, occurred since 2001. Um, 2021 was the sixth hottest year on record. And as you can see by the red, it was the single hottest year in many parts of the ocean and indeed many parts of China as well. And, and, and in terms of ocean, about 93% of the extra heat we, 
we are putting into the atmosphere, it is absorbing that atmosphere, and we'll come on to the ocean a little later. Um, so a, a really good tool to sort of uh, play with this yourself afterwards in terms of going both global and local is this one here, show your stripes. Uh, you can go in, this is the world's picture of warming stripes, of just average temperature. This is the science um, in the industrial age to, to now. Um, and then you can go to New York State. This is New York State stripes, a little bit more varied, as you probably get with sort of the, the, the snow in April as I got here. Um, but, but you can certainly see the sort of the absolute trend uh, that there is no doubt about it, what we are doing to the planet. And um, with a hat off now to Johan Rockström and a huge team of scientists that pulled all this stuff together, they, they, they've, dubbed this, they've, they've dubbed this sort of time on Earth really as the great acceleration. If you think of the things we are doing as a human race as the stuff on the left in the orange, um, and you think of the things in green as the sort of how the world, the planet, the natural systems have reacted. So on the, on the, on the, on the, um, uh, the piece on the left, on, our, on, our, on what we are doing, uh, there's things like the population. It took to 1960 to get to the first three billion people on the planet. We've gone over seven on the way to nine or 10. Um, in, in GDP, well, the, the good news, they're wealthy. Um, and transportation wasn't really a thing pre-industrial age, certainly not from a carbon emissions perspective. Um, and, and then on the other side, if you think almost like scientists interviewing the planet and saying, well, what are the stressors, what's happened? Um, it's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has just gone up. And just remember how thin a strip we are talking about that we are adding to. Um, and oceans have got, uh, they, they've been absorbing this extra. Um, they've got more and more acidic. And for those that are in the room that are um, potentially on the business side or going into, you know, sort of, or, or work with the private sector, you might think of this as a balance sheet. You can make a loss, um, you know, sort of year after year. Certainly, you can have a dip in COVID and come back out. But if you keep making a loss, your balance sheet has got nothing left. And this is a coral reef that has gone from basically alive to, to, to dead. Um, and, and think of the, the, the ocean as taking our debt, taking our losses, but it can't take the losses forever. Um, so we've really, we've moved in, and again, this is sort of uh, Rockstrom's uh, sort of analysis and, and, and communication, which I think is fantastic for us to spot just what have we done in these last few years. Um, uh, well done, you're getting tired, aren't you, with, uh, with, this, with this strange accent. Um, so in terms of how long ago um, uh, the, the, the temperature variability is, you know, so from humans were on the planet 100,000 years ago through to 5,000 to 10,000 years ago, that's when the temperature stabilized. And, and, and scientists call that period the Holocene, where, you know, sort of across, and I think about four or five different places around the world, farming was invented. We settled. We didn't have to move as much uh, because the temperature settled at around about that time. But then what we've done since is we've hit into these stressors. We've done that, those things on the left in the great acceleration. And what those 300 plus scientists have put into a nice sort of unifying framework is called the planetary boundaries. And again, lots of stuff you can find on the internet afterwards if you want to find out more. Just these idea of like nine boundaries that we are getting towards the edges of because we are doing too much of, for instance, a, a, a one for an agricultural community like this, biogeochemical flows, like the, the fertilizer, just too much, and, and, and it's, it's, it's beyond the safe zones. Um, biosphere integrity, the loss of species on, on the planet, which we, again, is well documented, and climate change and more. So um, what the scientists said, actually, is we've moved into this new age from a Holocene to what's called the Anthropocene, where we've really, as, as the name of his, his book, um, uh, Rockstrom's book says, it's like we've moved from being a small world on a big planet to a big world on a small planet. We've become the dominant geological force, and they marked it as the dawn of the nuclear test. Um, another, another way to have a look at this, of this, like how dominant are we as a race, is this one that came out recently on mass. Um, it just in 2020, human-caused mass exceeded the amount of natural mass. So that's 1,120 gigatons of uh, natural mass in the world and, one, uh, and 1,154 now in human-caused mass. Um, also equally distressing if you sort of double-click on this, and there's lots to explore here, 
there's, I think it's four gigatons worth of animal kingdom mass if you weighed the animal kingdom, but eight gigatons of plastic mass. Another way to look at this is, is just the age of the planet. You know, so four, is it 4.6 uh, billion years? Um, somebody said, well, how about that as a 46-year-old? Um, let's just call it 46. Um, or it's a party or a village, whatever you like as an analogy that's been going on for 46 years. Um, th these, this, this nasty little thing called humans arrived about four hours ago in this 46-year-old sustainable village. Um, one minute ago, they had this brilliant idea called the Industrial Revolution, and then just in that last minute, destroyed half the world's forests. So as a, as a, as a party, Gore, as a host, you'd be slightly upset about this new guest, I think. Um, and so that's us on the planet. So how do we move on from here? Um, I love this one from The Onion. They always pick me up from the bottom. Uh, pressure mounting for humans to step down as head of uh, this failing global ecosystem. It's time for us to find, find another, another, another thing to, to make a better job at this. Um, but there's lots of data uh, to back all this up. Over 30 years of the IPCC, which I, I really, like, there's lots of things going on out there in terms of where can you get your facts. IPCC.ch is a great one because the members are not scientists. The members are the countries that then put up their best scientists. 195 countries join, um, all, all of them, basically, and then put their best scientists and make them volunteer on it or ask them to volunteer, which they do. And then that, and they don't do any primary research. They assess how reliable the facts and the research are that's out there. So a great source, and, and, you know, sort of just, and, and just out this over the last couple of months is the sixth assessment report of which I draw upon as well. So again, primary source for anyone wanting to say what are the results, what's happening, um, I would go there. Lots of data though is the, is the headline. And we're increasingly noticing as a human race that these systems and the problems, you know, both the problems and the solutions are interconnected. I like this map from the WEF a few years ago, just showing that the human problems that we do really care about and do find urgent are actually interlinked with all these longer term problems that we're creating on the climate. And let's, uh, last thought on the big picture before we move on, is just to, to, to remember, especially in a privileged setting like this, is that it's way more some people than others. This really unfortunate cocktail glass is it's, it's the top richest 1% of the planet that are causing half the emissions, and the poorest 50% are responsible for only 10% of the emissions. So let's just be clear who's causing it as well. So that's the big picture. Let's think about, and it, it's simple, like we're, we're, we're mucking this up. Um, but the solution spaces are complex, but also exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the concept of net zero. When it first, well, the first time I heard about it was in COP20. Uh, it was getting into the, what they call square brackets of text in the lead up to COP21, the Paris climate talks. And this idea of net zero, because I think we can all get hold of it as a community, as a person, and maybe as a, as a camper. You, you look at this world and you say, if I'm camping here, I don't wanna leave the campsite worse for the next campers in than, than myself. That is really the concept of net zero. We don't want to leave the world in a worse sight as we, as we did when we came in. And it works on the global level. It's enshrined in the Paris Agreement. It, as I say, it, it came through the, uh, all the, the various places where the countries gathered um, to be enshrined in Article 4 of the Paris Agreement as this idea of achieving balance at the global level, that we get emissions down so low that the world's natural ability can, to absorb them is, is, is all that's left. So we're in balance as a, as a planet. So you do it as a global level, but think about the campsite. We can do it as a family, a community, um, Genesee, uh, Genesee as, a, as, as a county, our own as an individual. It works on these different levels and companies, which I think you might s see in, in the panel to come. Um, and we really need to bend this curve. This is the IPCC's, it's called Working Group 3, just showing Really, if there's, if there's a, a place like how fast do we need to go in the solution spaces now, halving by 2030, half again by 2040, and then we're getting close to net zero, you know, sort of between 2040 and 2050. And we're getting into the, the place where we can get limit warming on average to, to a sort of a safe operating space. And, 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 and what needs to change then? It's basically everything. 
Um, it's, it's, it's every sector. If you notice that sort of, we have to bend around now, around the early 2020s, and it's energy, it's infrastructure, transport, um, uh, and, and was it land use, industry, and finance, and getting the money to move. It's just, it's a, we, we need to bend the curve across all of them. And so if you're looking for solution spaces after this symposium, I, I would recommend um, going to something like Project Drawdown, where you can see all the solutions in, 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 in wonderful sort of detail, and also as a league table. Um, well, how many gigatons do we think we can get out of that? And, what th and they're also grouped by thematic that you might be drawn upon, say, the, take the bullet points on the left-hand side and say, I oh, see, that's something that I really care about. Well, then you'll find a whole suite of climate solutions that are in, are in that theme that you care about. And then the other th sort of way to look at the solutions, so that's almost like a, a suite of them and how many tons uh, could we get out um, the other piece, obviously, is the economics. Is like, how, how much does it cost to get these tons out? And for a long time, consultants and, and scientists have looked at this. Um, the, the, the one on the left is called the McKinsey cost curve. Uh, they looked at it, and, and then it was, the, it was called the, the benefit curve afterwards by the Global Economic Commission, I think it was. Um, the key thing for us to, to, to look at here, if you think of the x-axis as how many tons of CO2 we have to um, it, uh, sort of reduce, and the, the y-axis is the cost. If it's above the axis, it costs, it, it costs something uh, on the left-hand side. It costs something to do. If it's underneath, it actually makes us money. And then it's the flip on, on the right-hand side. That's a benefit. So it's a, almost like a profit to do on the left and, and you know, sort of a loss on the right. Key piece here is there's no one square that gets us all the way across. So there's no silver bullet. We have to do everything. Like this, there's... There's the forest land use piece, there's the buildings, the energy, the infrastructure, all the things from the last slide. So all those little bars, none of them are, are huge bars. But the other piece is, if you eyeball it from where you are in the room, you think, actually, the piece on the bottom looks roughly the same to the piece on the top. So it's not necessarily a more expensive thing for the world to do, especially if you factor in the cost of inaction. So, but, but the actual making the transition, it's hard, and the money's not always in the right places, and the risk isn't always in the right places, but as a world, we can afford to do this. And to, to underline that with absolutely very recent data, back to that IPCC uh, working group report, the blues in here are the places where actually, you know, sort of it makes money to do the, these, these changes. There's a lot of blues around transport going more, more efficient. There's a lot of blues up top on wind and solar energy. And then as you can see, there's a variety of costs on some of the other fixes. And I welcome you to kind of, all this stuff is freely available on the internet. You can double click and explore the pieces that are closest to your sector of interest um, or your themes of interest. Um, McKinsey just came out with this one this week, so lots of, lots of data for you that is just absolutely fresh off the presses and coming out. Um, this one's called Playing Offense in the Transition to the New Economy. And you could probably spot your industry, again, if you're in, in, the, in the community here, um, which has got massive economic opportunity as they, as they have analyzed between now and the end of 2030, whether it's ag and land use, uh, water, buildings, and no, also, oil, gas, and fuels. You know, like if you're involved in uh, the fossil fuel economy, we still need you to get cleaner. We st and, and, you know, we need the skills and we need the assets to be clean as we transition towards a sustainable future. So to simplify all this, again, I wanted to kind of come away where you say, like, like what, what, what might I remember from this morning? It's like, think of the cost of clean and the cost of dirty as two lines on your page. And if you've still got your notepad, um, this is worth uh, getting your pen up again. Um, um, the fundamentals of clean is it's the technology, not a fuel. We are riding down a cost curve. So you can draw a smooth curve down, um, and, and things get better, cheaper, cleaner, more ubiquitous, more powerful as we go down them. Think about the costs of anything from, as it says there, wind, PV, um, you know, solar, battery costs, LED buildings. And again, back to that brand new report, it shows you not only the costs that have ridden down, but then the adoption of these, of, these, of these technologies. So the cost of clean is a smooth curve, and the cost of dirty is a, is a squiggly upward curve. And we've seen it even at commodities are getting harder to dig out, dirtier and more expensive, and they're volatile. And as we've seen tragically, 
over the last few weeks. They were also vulnerable to, to global shocks as well. So what we've got is an area on the left of just about any sector, just about any geography, where dirty is cheaper than clean. And then we've got a crossover where they're about the same. And then on the right-hand side, we've got it where clean is cheaper than dirty. So if everything's over here on the right-hand side, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's fine. We will all expand well. But not all the sectors, not all the geographies are in the right-hand side. So how do we get things to move from left to right? I put in Stonehenge in there just to say, like, we're, once we get over the crossover, um, our old, my, my old boss, uh, Jose Mira Figueres, said, like, like, we're going to move on from the Stone Age, not because we ran out of stones. We're going to move on from the fossil fuel age, not because we've, we've run out of all fossil fuels to dig. It's because we've got something better that is now cheaper. So what is on the left, and how do we get it to the right? Um, so in that solution space, I love this example, and again, having just sort of driven up in one as well, just, just seeing the electric vehicle availability. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So this is how many uh, electric vehicles were available on the different sort of parts of the, of the car market, um, and, the, and the performance of the range is across the bottom. So this is in 2009, this is 2017, this is 2020, and if I was to put to 2022, I think the chart would be almost full. Um, especially if you watch the Super Bowl, how many of those ads in, in halftime were about electric vehicles um, from um, all the major OEMs that you know? And, and this trend will only get more pronounced because lithium-ion batteries are 73% down cost since 2008, but they're forecast to go down another 75% in the, next in, in the next decade, as well as other technologies potentially being better as well. So the idea is like as we're approaching the crossover, where it's getting obvious that electric vehicles are actually fundamentally cheaper to run than uh, internal combustion, then the whole behavior of the economy changes much faster and, and everything changes as you get close to that crossover. So key question as you're sort of thinking about like, what can I do is like, what's on the left? What's getting close to the crossover on cost and scale? And then what, and how can we get it more to the right? So that's what needs to change. The next piece is who needs to change. And the great thing is you are all needed because every single sector is necessary and none are sufficient. Sort of whether it's, it's policy, whether it's the people rising and wanting these things, business and industry making them, finance and capital moving money, we need every sector to do this and we need them to work together. Again, sort of name checking my, my old boss, Jose Maria, on this. He said the really interesting things happen at the intersect between the sectors, not necessarily in deep in the sectors themselves. So where are these sectors coming together and talking about solutions? So who needs to change? Um, countries, uh, ha hat off here to a, a student at Yale, uh, Franz Hochstrasser, who sort of came out of the COP negotiations, eyes popping with, this is how the, the, the countries negotiate or used to negotiate in the climate talks, the different factions. This is complicated. I think the UK climate negotiator in Glasgow said, like, imagine 195 of us trying to agree what's for lunch. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard trying to put a climate agreement together. Um, and, and, th and this, is, this is sort of diagram shows some of that. Um, there's really interesting things happening in non-state actors, in municipalities, uh, whether it's C40 cities, um, many towns and cities um, signing on to their own pledges then doing municipal laws, um, Beijing and, and, and many others sort of leading the charge on, on, on where to go there. I think you probably might be hearing of some policies uh, coming up afterwards. And then as a, almost like a collection of non-state actors, and I'm involved in this um, in the review group, it's called the UNFCCC's Race to Zero. It's almost like a club of clubs of ambition, people that uh, all want to get to net zero and get there as fast as they can in support of the country. So it's almost like a parallel initiative to the country and negotiations. And there's real growing interest and in action in this area. And then just remember on this um, um, Venn diagram that w capital can move far quicker than the, the real economy. So there was these, uh, uh, post the Paris Agreement, the, the fundamentals of the coal industry hadn't changed you know, like, like between the Friday and the Monday but there were hundreds of coal company bankruptcies afterwards because the capital said, I don't want to be holding this bag now with this sentiment out there and dropped the bag and moved. So, that the, the, so, so that think of the idea of capital 
being essential to scale up the good, but it can move quicker. And so to watch in the, as that capital moves. And then the other piece that I think is a really recent game changer and a really positive one, I think, for the whole process in the last couple of you know, uh, country negotiations, ones I've seen in the middle Saturday and more, the sort of the Fridays, is, is, is the rise of the youth movement, the rise of anger, justifiable anger and frustration that this is the w world we're inheriting. And it's having a real impact, I think, in the negotiation rooms in uh, the countries and in the corporate boardrooms in terms of how they design their products and which people, the talent they're trying to attract. So that's where the solution spaces are, uh, to sort of paint a sort of picture there that all is necessary, none is sufficient, lots of economic opportunity as we get close to that crossover. I wanted to move on to now, is this like, what, what am I excited about? What am I working on? And then close on what are you excited about? What do you want to work on? Um, I think of my um, career over the last couple of years and hopefully for the next few as working with this very simple Venn diagram. I'm really excited and passionate about what I call connected leadership, um, marrying purpose to performance and, and, and having purpose-driven leaders out there changing the world for the better, and then the great work of getting to a sustainable planet. And most of the stuff I do is in that sweet spot in the middle, but I do some stuff on just coaching and leadership and, some, and teaching and some on just climate stuff. Um, so on, on the connected leadership, I'm trying to help anybody from students uh, to executives to one-on-one uh, -on -one coaches on, 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 on being more present across their purpose, across their priorities, their potential, and their progress to move towards that. And I think of that as a rope. You're as strong as the weakest of those fibers, being mindful on all four of those and thinking at the self level, the team, and the system. And then the great work, this is just one of the ones that I think is one of the most beautiful, sort of almost like apolitical um, uh, ways in this polarized country that we, 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 are, we are living in, uh, just an apolitical way of saying, what is the sort of work that we have to do as humanity at these crucial crossroads we're in? And we've got to move into basically be a benign force with ourselves and a benign force on the planet. And, and really, that's the great work. So um, how can we do that? So that's what I'm excited about, anything in the sweet spot of, of those two. One of those on the climate side is this race to zero. I said I joined the review group. And I love the challenge we've got now as a planet on target setting on the non-state actors, the companies, the cities, et cetera, navigating between ambition and clarity. So ambition, I mean, we've, we sort of, the science is clear. We're destroying the Earth. And the guy's saying, can you put that in a slightly more roundabout way, please, that I can understand? Um, you know, sort of, but we, the, so the ambition is absolutely critical, but so is clarity. The clarity in what you're saying and what you're targeting. I think I, I put this diagram in a paper that I, I co-wrote with a friend, Casey Pickett, um, saying that on high ambition, high clarity, that's what we need to inspire the right action and get us moving. Um, if you're just ambitious and you put out a claim, but you're not clear on how you're going to do it or, or who you need to get gathered around to get, you know, be successful, then it sounds good, but it could be greenwashing. And if you're just clear but not ambitious enough, then it's too incremental. We don't have time to have people like you doing this, and we certainly don't have time for people that are neither ambitious nor clear. So how do we do that as a race to zero? Um, we all want a truly mass start. You'll find this embedded in the race to zero language about pledging. You've got to sort of say where you want to go, plan, proceed, then publish, and be willing to sort of be held to account. But can we have starting criteria, like a mass start, but can we also have leadership criteria? What does it look like to actually win the race, to actually get out there and demonstrate and, and, and be out there? And what's fantastic about reading the, the, the panel's bios is they're out there in the lead showing people how this can be done. Um, so on that clear leadership criteria, I'm fascinated about tightening the definition of net zero itself. I said it's at, at a simple level, the global level, you know, it's that campsite, it's that world in balance. But can we have fully scoped net, net zero, as in people taking responsibility for all the scopes of, of, of their, their, their operations and, and, and how their products are used? Science-based, owning the emissions reduction trajectory that is appropriate for their sector. There is a, a, a fantastic initiative called the Science Based Targets Initiative that does that sector by sector. It says this is the, the curve that we need uh, to go down. Um, that it has to be global and car global carbon budget compliant. We should all have one set of emissions and one set of accounts. We currently don't have that. And then 
a, a, a cheekier one is can we be can we be cumulative as well uh, to be net zero? Net zero is not just in balance on the day. It's just like the world remembers the emissions we've been putting in for 200 years. It's a little bit like if you were eating for free at the local restaurant, and then you say, hey, I'm paying the bill now. You know, sort of pat in the back, please. It's like the restaurant manager remembers all the free food you've eaten. So can we, as, uh, as a world, start to think about, well, what are the carbon tons we put up there already, and can we take responsibility for those? And that could be capital N, capital Z, net zero. Um, so I think the, the cumulative piece, I think, is, is, is fair. Uh, it's putting boundaries around what, you know, sort of responsibilities of the rich world. It sort of potentially restores equity, but with some rational boundaries. And it could be, get a huge amount of capital to end deforestation, putting money in the interesting places uh, that aren't currently getting enough money a, to a, save deforestation, other negative emission technologies that might need more money. That this, this responsibility might be interesting and might even lubricate the north-south tension that we have at some of the negotiations. So on that side, I'm really excited about this idea of pushing for ambition and clarity, and pushing not only for a mass start on this excitement of net zero, but a critical mass finish. And let's go back to that, um, the, the sad story on the forests. You know, on the tropical rainforests, there are 6% of the world's land mass, but store 50% of um, the world's carbon that's locked inside plant material. So, Saving the tropical rainforests that are standing is just absolutely critical. It's, it's one of those ones that we must, it's a necessary but insufficient condition. Um, if, if, if we put it on the league table of emitters out there, it would be the third biggest emitter if it was a country in terms of deforestation. And so what I'm working to do um, in the, uh, uh, sort of there's a council for voluntary carbon markets. I'm looking at, at, at the rainforest nations on, on the supply side. Can we combine the might of the Paris Agreement which has all these countries saying, this is how many tons we are saving or we're cutting down and we want to get better. And the scalability, but current small size of the voluntary carbon markets on the right. Can we get those people to be talking better together and working towards a coherent solution? Such that the country is the key unit of supply when we're talking about carbon credits and saving forests. Because the country then has to take account for not only its, its uh, forest preservation projects that it's getting money for, but also the logging operations. And it says, net, net, this is, the, this is my responsibility as a country. And then we're only looking at, say, 50, 60 nations to say, can, are, are we doing this? Can you solve it? The fundamental question there that I, I, I wrestle with a lot, as, as do many in this field, is think, what would it take to really change the economics on the ground so that trees are worth more alive than dead? And that is something that is, 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 a, is a global question. Um, from that big question, let's go super local. The other thing I'm excited about is Westport, this little town of 25,000 people where my kids currently are, um, uh, terrorizing their mother because it's, it's break. Um, and sustainable Westport is something that I volunteer on. And I think there's a there's sort of sustainability initiatives um, around here as well. Um, so we're doing everything from composting trying to get people to get their, their bins out and then uh, either get it, getting those, that, the, those food scraps taken or they go to the, the local recycling center, um, municipal solar, uh, 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 residential solar, and all the other things that are, you, you, many of you know in the room of what we're doing. So I'm excited to try and wrestle with these global questions, but then also sort of turn up on a Tuesday night and say like, well, how are we going to do this, guys? And, and that's really interesting learning, I think, across both, you know, both slash all levels. So my last section for you, Hopefully that's in some ideas to get you both sort of around the sort of simplicity of the problem, the complexity of the solutions, and what, where you might be interested in, in leaning in next, is what are you excited about in this, as I say, this narrow but huge opportunity? And each one of us in the room has that window of opportunity to, to, to get into. Um, so you've hopefully had on your notepad here, sort of what am I interested in improving? When you're thinking about that, name the system. And, and, and we, we teach this in, in the Yale course about like, it's really important to know what size of system are you talking about? What's the problem of the system that you care about? And, and think about the definition of the system before you work out what's going on in that system. Name it, define the problem, and you know, what do you want to find out next? You could have something super simple on your notepad today, which is just like, find out more about X. That would still be great. Um, what drives you to get involved? I, as per the four Ps I put up earlier, 
It's like you are going to be much stronger in this next window of opportunity if you know why you're doing these things. So what drives you? It might be something about the stories of your generation's past. It might be sort of what you, know, sort of what you got taught when you were a kid. But put that down because that will give you the strength that you're going to need um, to lean in on this. And then the other piece is it's much more fun if it's, you're doing it with somebody else, but it's also more effective. We can't change systems on our own. So who are you most interested in working for or with? It could be to join uh, something that pre-exists. It could be like, no, I need to lead and step up. Um, any of those, an organization to work for, to partner with, um, will achieve far more together. So hopefully you're noting those down. Um, and, and in terms of concepts, the idea for all of us is like, what's on the left? How do we get it more onto the right-hand side? And then who is going to be needed for those solutions to happen? So diving in locally, as well as wrestling with these, these global pieces, as was set up by Jay at the very start, um, you know, there could be curriculum that you could get involved in, clubs to get involved in. I think there's, um, uh, I, had, I was checking with some names at the start, and they're on the back of your program. Peggy Marone is on Leadership Genesee um, through the Cornell Connection. Um, Chris Swazi is on the Leadership um, Genesee with, with the Genesee uh, EDC. There's people in this room that are, are, are hyper-local and want to talk to you about what you might want to do to help. And then for those that are sort of, well, all stages, but especially the younger folks that are thinking about what do I do after I graduate, is like your next career move is really important to not only you, but to the companies and make them move and make them uh, sort of behave differently. This is a study that was just updated this year. Over half of students uh, polled in this report um, are willing to accept a lower salary to work for the right company. And 78% of students say they want to work for a company with good environmental practices. So 26 would not even accept a job at a company with bad. So the idea is like that you move voting with your feet. And as companies, if you want to win the war on talent, which is tighter than ever, then it's, it's, it's like, like start, start, start sort of um, displaying your environmental credentials and looking for them as talent. And then just think about anchoring it into these special slash strange slash crazy times. Can we actually engineer an intelligent recovery? Can we remember some of the stuff when the air quality looked more like the right-hand side? This was a Guardian newspaper slider um, for India uh, after the first lockdown. Um, can, you know, sort of, can, can we remember what that air quality looks like? Some of the good practices that came out of the COVID era. And as we emerge, can this actually help our ambition? And I, I, I wanted to explain the tree that I put on my cover page. Just the idea, and it's, it, it's, it's nature, nothing like the nature, the beautiful nature I saw driving here. But nature, this is in Aruba, and an island that I've, I've worked with, um, looking at how does the island of Aruba go sustainable. And they look to the Divi Divi tree as inspiration because it leans with the prevailing winds. It's a thriving tree, but it knows where, where the wind is. Um, and can we do that? Can we thrive with nature? As, as Thomas Berry said, be a benign force not only on each other, but a benign force on the planet. So bringing, bringing us all in, um, and for those that said, like, 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 that was quite a lot, onto one page. Um, addressing the global climate crisis in this narrow window, but huge opportunity that is exciting for us all to grasp, hopefully. On the big picture side, as I've said there, think about the planetary boundaries, that idea that we're stressors. Think about that short drive. If you pointed it upwards, it's us. And also remember, it's some of us more than others. And all these things are connected. On the solution spaces, think about the excitement of the net zero destination, being able to function at the global level, company level, community level, you level. And that the fundamentals uh, that we, uh, we have to move, it's basically the whole economy. And that all is necessary, none are sufficient. And then what I'm excited about in terms of what I do, like that net zero, getting the clarity with the ambition, I think is an exciting place. Saving the rainforest, bringing the Paris Agreement more closely with the voluntary carbon markets, and then acting locally, understanding what needs to happen at the community level. What are you excited about? Why are you interested? Think about that. What do you want to work on slash find out more and who for and who with? So I want to, I want to close with just get your cell phones out for one last time. Um, I wanted to close with um, the same question. 
and see if anything's changed. If, uh, and now, if you were to place yourself in one of the six Americas, where would you self-declare? I can't remember the exact numbers before, um, but I will, you'll be able to compare on the slides that I'll, I'll put on, this, on the website. Thank you, everybody. That's a lot of votes. That's over 60. Okay. And how optimistic are you that you can solve this? Uh, we can solve this as a world. I'm trying to recruit people on the stubborn optimist threes. That's great. Fours, we love you and we need you. Because um, you have to talk to the ones. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and how optimistic are you? Do you think that we can solve this here as a community? This feels hopefully the same slash slightly more optimistic. I'll check it afterwards. And then the last one I said, I said that um, I would save till the end. What word, or if you want to have two words together, connect it with an underscore, what describes what you might want to do differently and or lead after the symposium finishes and we all go our separate ways? What are some of those things? Think. Learn more. Again, if you like any, any of the words there, then it will suddenly get big. And yes, people are now into their emojis. That's great. Knowledge, action. Action's the bigger word. Brilliant. Information. There was end capitalisms up at the top as well. Sustainable. Involvement. Action still winning. Action, change, information, awareness, educate yourselves. This is a fantastic uh, group. I think you can keep voting even when I click over. Um, back to, back, so I want to I wanna close. Um, with just one, one slide about the sort of the idea back to the kilt. The serious point on the kilt, other than dressing up uh, with you, is that I wanted to make it very clear, other than remember it was that guy, remember we were in that room, um, this is how he was dressed. But I'm the curious outsider. I come here, I feel incredibly welcome, and I love what I see, and, I, and, and, and just everyone has treated me with such grace and such welcome, but I don't know your community, I don't know what's happening here, and I don't know the potential. I come here from outside. Um, and so, you know, what can you do? That you know, sort of, I was stopping on the way uh, with my, my, my colleague Suzanne, seven generations of farming, and a, and a vineyard owner, and a policy, policy expert, and all the other things uh, that she does, joined by four others. It's like there's local expertise you're about to hear from, but also local expertise in the room. So um, with that, um, I really want to thank you so much for your time and attention today. Hopefully you got some ideas. Hopefully you got some inspiration. I um, look forward to hanging around and speaking to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very quickly, anybody, one or two questions? Would you like to slip into our keynote here, please? Say that? The Tesla 3, I know that. There's a microphone right there. And come right up to that. Anybody else? Any other questions before we get? the next segment. Obviously, Peter will be here. Please stand up and articulate into the microphone with your... Thank you. Do you know how um, anaerobic digestion works? A anaerobic digestion? Do I know how it works? I don't. I, 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 am, I am in awe of the people that work on that and, and, and uh, sort of help some startups at Yale that are into it. Um, but I do not know how it works. I'm sorry. Uh, that's, a good, that's a Google one. We do have a um, local expert here, though. John yeah. Noble sitting here at who, the table next to our chairperson, Mr. Rogers, who happens to be doing that. There's a display over there uh, with regard to uh, what they're doing at Noblehurst Farms and have been doing for a number of years. Um, and that's at a, at a agricultural slash 
local level rather than what I've seen in the past at the municipal level. But John Nobles is here, so you can tap into his expertise and ask him that question directly. Anybody else? Ah, there you go. I was trying to give you a mic. That's okay. <coughs> All right, folks. So, again, Peter, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Ecology uh, and environmental ecology, biology, excuse me. Um, and so, to sort of keep us on track, um, I'm going to turn it over and ask our panelists to come forward, please. Also, um, one thing that'll be sort of a wrap up those of you who have programs, at each table you can see there's a flower arrangement. Uh, in one of those programs at each table, there is a code, a barcode, that should be on the next, I think it's on the the uh, fourth page, or the page eight, if you have that, that sucker is yours, okay? We want everything to go, be a lot easier to clean up here for the staff. All right, so. Okay, great, thank you so much. Please take great. over. Great, great. <laughs> All right, terrific. Uh, thanks everyone for hanging in there. Uh, what a wonderful job by Peter kind of setting the stage. Hopefully you can hear me okay. There's a bit of an echo in here. I just, uh, luckily we have a great interpreter too. But um, so first of all, thanks so much. You know, it's my pleasure. I am Ben Holton, the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. There was a, a question about anaerobic digesters and we have a, a couple of experts up here. We're gonna talk to those things and John Noble, of course, can tell you all about that uh, if you wanna hear more. So it's wonderful to have such a full audience in person. There's nothing like the energy of people coming together around issues that are so incredibly important and, and sometimes can appear intractable. But I think one of the messages that we heard from Peter, which we want to continue to capitalize on, is that climate is changing. It's bad and it's getting worse. We know why and we can solve it. And I think that's the incredible moment in front of us today is to think about the array of solutions that can work across all sectors of society to bend the carbon curve and reverse the warming that we're seeing to help people uh, move forward. So thanks again to the organizers here, uh, Genesee Community College, of course, for the event. And I was doing a little bit of reading in the pamphlet uh, before coming up. Uh, sounds like Jay Humphrey III was quite an inspiring individual. And, you know, I think this, this one sentence there, approaching problems as opportunities. You know, so it's, it's really terrific to know that that's the legacy uh, under which we are gathering here today to talk more about the central issue. Uh, also, I wanna say that it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, I can understand why Jim Beheim felt very much at home uh, in 2003 when he was the <laughs> keynote speaker. I think that was the year they won the, the national championship too for Syracuse fans out there. Of course, I'm go Big Red, but it's all good. Um, but this arena in particular, the Richard C. Call Arena, uh, resonates uh, personally because 
Dick Call was really a giant of agriculture, and the Call family has contributed, uh, well, still runs a very successful farm here locally, my two acres, and has contributed in so many ways to Cornell Cal's, uh, giving back to the college and university. So, of course, his influence radiated well beyond Cornell, and we're here today uh, inspired by, by his namesake. So before talking uh, with the panelists here today, I just want to give a couple of brief comments, including where I see incredibly exciting opportunities for agriculture to be a powerful weapon in the fight against climate change. Now, we know that based on studies, about one-fifth, so let's say 20 percent, of our agricultural yields have been lost to climate change in the United States already. And it's likely we're going to continue to face extreme weather that we have to deal with. But the notion that carbon can become a commodity is something I really want to uh, talk a bit about before we get over to our panelists, because I think it's a great opportunity for farmers, ranchers to get together and figure out how they can be uh, effective in this climate fight we have. So we know climate's here, and we know what's behind it. Uh, we already heard from Peter, so I won't kind of go through all the, uh, the issues. I did co-author a paper last year where we analyzed 88,000 scientific studies that have been published. That's a, that's a lot of studies in the peer-reviewed literature, and we found 99.9% .9 agreement that greenhouse gases are the principal cause of the climate change we're seeing today. So the science is unequivocal, but the solutions are complex, as was noted, and the opportunities to come together through climate are uh, here, here for the taking, I believe. So we also know that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, just issued their report about prolonged droughts, heat waves, flooding, cyclones, and other powerful storms that are continuing to grow throughout the world. Uh, we had an author at Cornell Cal's who was part of that report, and the warning was simple. It's that we have a rapidly closing window in which we must start to act across all sectors of society to bend this carbon curve. So the damages of climate change we know are not some far distant future. In fact, if you look at New York State, the average rate of temperature rise is about twice that of the global average. And so uh, Peter identified this sort of 1.5 or 2 degree threshold that we are concerned about. And I just want to highlight that in New York State, we've already exceeded that threshold locally. And we've seen the influence of that on droughts and flooding and other things that are affecting our farm communities. So farmers know firsthand uh, that this is a real issue. Uh, one, one kind of anecdote example is that if you look at the maple industry, which is growing rapidly in New York State, uh, partly from Cornell Cal's and all the other SUNYs that are coming together to support the industry, it used to be that uh, trees would be tapped in, you know, February, March, something like that, but typically around late February or early March. Today, they're tapping trees in January. Now, the reason is because it's getting warmer earlier, and so some may say, well, that's a great opportunity, but we know that with these changes in climate, the pests, the pathogens, they are moving in to our agricultural landscapes, and it's becoming a more difficult challenge for us to deal with. So we have to really come together at every corner of society to take action. Now, I also want to add, in New York State, there's a uh, new act called the uh, CLCPA. That's the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act. And it is going to affect positive change in New York State. A lot of that is about clean energy and electrification. In fact, the ambition of the CLCPA is net zero electricity by 2040, and it's the most ambitious plan of any state that has put forth. So we're really excited to continue to think about how to decarbonize society and uh, have agriculture be a part of the solution. So I, I want to take just a brief moment and talk a little bit about my own work in that area. You know, I've been exploring how we can take advantage of natural climate solutions in the soil to drive carbon uh, into the soil environment and then turn that into high-value commodity for farmers. And one of the technologies I've been working on is called enhanced weathering. So it's a fancy word. It just means taking rock dust as a byproduct of mining operations that is typically buried because there's no use of, uh, for it 
and instead adding that back to the soil. And our group has found over hundreds of acres that there's typically increased crop yields. It has kind of a liming effect to help with uh, the pH of the soil. And it also drives substantial carbon dioxide removal. And uh, just this week, uh, we're launching a new business in this uh, area of enhanced weathering that will be about driving negative carbon emissions and having farmers get paid for their carbon services. So more to come on that perhaps throughout our talk today. So as we continue to work on climate, it is going to take promising ideas from all fields, all elements of society coming together with agriculture and food being key in solving and adapting to uh, the challenges in front of us. So I'm excited to now introduce and turn this over to our panelists of experts. Each bring their own special knowledge to the climate challenge or to emissions or to starting businesses. And so we want to hear now a brief set of sort of elevator pitches of introductions and we'll go one by one uh, to hear a little bit about their approach to climate solutions in their own work. So we'll start this conversation uh, with Kurt and he is an expert in dairy. Uh, as mentioned, he has an affiliation with Cornell. And so I'll turn it over to you, Kurt, if you could just talk a little bit about your work and your insights on, on this challenge in front of us. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, first, I want to start by thanking um, Nathan Rutgers and uh, the committee for inviting me to come. I very much appreciate the opportunity. They're saying they need to move. So, um, so yes, I've been involved in the dairy industry essentially all my life um, in different roles and capacities, and I'm uh, very grateful for the opportunity to serve in that capacity. I have a strong passion for the dairy farmer and helping them to work towards sustainability. Um, we all know, most of us know, dairy is not exempt from uh, emitting greenhouse gases, just like uh, most everything else um, that uh, happens in our modern world. Um, methane, CO2, uh, nitrous oxide, to name specifically. Um, one of the things about those three gases is that uh, a lot of those gases are from uh, natural recycling of our cycle of uh, carbon nitrogen compounds above the Earth's surface. So a lot of that is not deep sequestered gas, or uh, uh, CO2, I'm sorry. Um, if we think about the contribution of dairy, um, and the anthropogenic greenhouse gases in the, in the country, um, we're looking at about 2% of the total. So, um, but yet dairy has embraced this. They basically said we are, uh, have an opportunity to reduce our emissions. And in fact, dairy farmers have been reducing their emissions for a long time. Um, the dairy farmers in the audience uh, will uh, 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 greatly appreciate me saying this, I think, to be honest with you, is that Dairy farmers are price takers, not price setters. So a, a truckload of milk leaves the Noblehurst farm. Um, they get what they get paid for it. So how do they stay in business? They have, to be they have to continue to work towards being sustainable. They work on efficiencies. They control their margins by doing a better job on the farm. And it just happens to be um, that uh, efficient farms also have reduced their greenhouse gas footprints significantly. Um, in fact, um, there's been work published um, by two leading scientists in the world about dairy's gr re um, greenhouse gas reductions over the last 10 years, from 2007 to 17. Um, Drs. Uh, Capper and Katie, both Cornell affiliates, um, graduates, um, postdocs, um, have worked all over the world in uh, greenhouse gas and LCA analysis. And so their 2019 report um, shows that there's like 25% a, a less cows, if you would, um, that's dairy cows, uh, required to make the same amount of milk in the United States now, or in 2017, I should say, than in 2007. So that's just an indication of, in the recent past, of how dairy farmers have reduced their greenhouse footprint um, they've also reduced their resource needs, 25% less water, lots of, a lot, uh, about the same less nutrients required. So because dairy farmers are price takers and not price setters, and that they control their margins by doing a better job, they have naturally reduced their greenhouse gases. Um, the U.S. dairy industry as a whole 
committed to reducing greenhouse gases to net zero by 2050 in 2020. Um, it's a long ways off. I worked at DMI for a couple, almost two years on that, um, figuring out how we're going to measure and monitor that progress. Um, so that is the probably the more, more current um, uh, and important thing is that they're reporting on the progress every five years. So as a whole, the farmers have, have reduced their emissions quite a bit, those that have stayed in business, and the U.S. dairy industry has embraced this as well and said we're going we're to work towards net greenhouse gas zero. Um, keeping it all in mind that we're less than 2% of the <coughs> anthropogenic emissions in the United States. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. So we'll get more into uh, some of those solutions and these efficiencies and also some of the new opportunities in, in dairy to continue to think about anaerobic digesters and soil health benefits in a bit. So that was great. So next I would like to turn it over to Dan. And uh, Dan, if you could talk a little bit about your perspective on sort of climate emissions and, and obviously with plug power what your thinking is on, on how to deal with some of the challenges we've been talking through. Great. Thanks again for being inviting me here. It's really great to come and talk about this. I guess a background on myself, I've been an environmentalist all my life. I uh, really want to leave the world a better place than when I found it, so I really mm -hmm. have been focused on that my whole adult life and my whole career. I started out at General Motors working on reducing emissions in vehicles. Uh, spent many years trying to do that. Went to work on electric vehicles and spent a lot of time on the General Motors electric vehicle programs, and then turned myself into a hydrogen expert and start, have been working on the hydrogen economy that's coming that I think is one of the pillars of being able to really uh, continue to reduce the emissions uh, in, in lots of different applications. So from a hydrogen perspective, Plug Power is really focused on creating the first really commercially viable use for hydrogen in our forklift industry. We currently have about 50,000 forklifts out there that run on hydrogen every day. We have giant customers like Amazon, Walmart, Wegmans, Home Depot that use our forklifts every single day. In fact, 20% of the food that's used and eaten in the U.S. today is moved by a hydrogen forklift. So we're out there doing our part. The next part of that, all of our customers, Walmart, Amazon, they all are demanding that we continue to make better and better improvements at all of their operations. And so they'd really like to use green hydrogen, which is hydrogen that's produced from renewable electricity. So anywhere you can find wind, solar, hydro, we want to turn that into hydrogen by cracking water into its components, hydrogen and oxygen, and using that hydrogen to fuel our vehicles. There's really a huge movement among all of large companies, as Peter clearly noted, moving toward really trying to take, uh, decarbonize their industry from start to finish. And so Plug Power is really aggressively moving down the green hydrogen economy and moving in that direction. So great. Excellent. Thank you. I like that, uh, you know, this, this green hydrogen. Maybe we in, in a bit we can talk about green and blue, mm -hmm. like some of the differences there, because there's, there's a lot of confusion, even myself sometimes, like which is which. And uh, they have very different implications, so that's, that's terrific. Okay, next we'll uh, hear from Suzanne. So going back to agriculture, but a different kind, not now with animals, now with plants and uh, in winemaking. <laughs> so why don't we talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure, sure. Um, we, we do grow the grapes as well. So um, yeah, and as, as uh, Peter mentioned, I, I wear that farm hat, so I'm part of the Hunt family. We're seven generation, eighth generation, if you count the little guys, farmers in the Finger Lakes. And then we also have our 40-year-old, 41-year-old winery now that my parents started. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about the climate solutions that we've deployed at the farm and at the winery a bit, but I also have another hat that I wear. So I'm also director for policy for a company called Generate Capital. Um, it was founded by one of the gentlemen that Peter and I worked with in Washington for a number of years. Um, and Generate is, was formed eight years ago to finance sustainable infrastructure. So basically to fill a gap in the financial ecosystem um, between like all the early stage exciting stuff where the venture capitalists are and the seed stage investors and then the institutional investors that would happily fund yet another coal plant. Um, and so there's a real gap there to fund all of the electric bus fleets, the community solar, the anaerobic digesters for waste. Um, and we actually are one of the early uh, funders of Plug Power. I think, I think you guys have eclipsed us. Um, they don't need us anymore, I think. They're so big, but that's exactly what we want to see. Um, 
But um, yeah, so so we are all connected, as has been said today, and um, everybody has to chip in. Um, putting my farm hat back on, um, we, we, uh, we um, a number of years ago, put in hundreds and hundreds of solar panels um, to power the operations. You know, people think of farming, they don't necessarily think of energy, but we're very energy intensive industries between the cooling and the pumps and the filters and, and all of those things. Um, we, about 10 years ago, put in a, a large, uh, closed loop geothermal heating and cooling system for all the buildings. Um, and uh, so when you know fuel prices have been spi spiking, it, we, it doesn't influence us. We just use a little bit of extra electricity to run our heat pumps. Um, so it's also a resilience and a financial sustainability strategy for us. Um, a number of years ago, we put in uh, five EV chargers so that colleagues like Peter could come and charge up. Um, and um, a lot of what we do is, is we're just familiarizing others with these, with these technologies. And it's, it's, it's a really nice part of agriculture to be in the wine industry because the customers come to our farm. Like it's not often that customers show up at a dairy farm where, or show up at the creamery or the, you know, the, the broccoli farm, but they come to us. So we have this really uh, nice educational opportunity and also just the ability to get people comfortable. So um, we also have a big focus on soil carbon. So we, my brother uh, composts all of the organic waste on the farm and also collects uh, waste from the community. Um, we, when we have time and some extra woody biomass lying around, uh, we make biochar and add it to the soil so we can talk about that. Um, we, you know, work on waste reduction um, to the plastics problems that Peter mentioned. We stopped using the plastic capsules on the bottles because mm. really it's just decorative. It's really don't need them. So there's a lot of less plastic in the world if ever if we can get the industry to switch. Um, you know, I could go on about more of the nuts and bolts, but I think probably the most important thing that we put our time into is industry-wide <laughs> efforts. So I chair an effort with the New York State Wine Association. Um, we're creating a sustainability certification scheme for wine. So you'll, in a year or two, you'll be able to see on the back label of a bottle which wineries are certified sustainable. So you can preferentially support the wineries that are that are doing their best to be sustainable. Um, and then we're also the first winery out in America outside of California to join the International Wineries for Climate Action. Um, which is part of the UN's race to zero, so more connectivity. Um, and so we are uh, working to um, account for all of our emissions, all scopes, one, two, and three, and um, ratchet them down over time, and use the strength of our collective buying power as an industry to um, work with our suppliers, like the glass makers and the cardboard makers, to, um, to work with them to get their emissions down because it's out of our direct control. So the kind of teaming up and working as whole industries is really critical right now. And I'm guessing I've run out of time, so I'll move on. But what I would say for the discussion is that I, I've, I was appointed to the Ag and Forestry panel of the climate of the CLCPA's Climate Action Council. We'll just call it the Climate Bill from now on, our Climate mm -hmm. Bill, just to make it easy. Um, and so I've been involved in that. And there's been this huge focus on the what. You know, everyone wants to talk about the heat pumps and the solar and the EVs. Mm -hmm. um, but we really have to spend a lot more time on the how. How do you pay for it? Where does the money come from? How do you permit it? How do you convince people to, to shift to, to new strategies? So um, hopefully like the broader community can focus more on the how. Great. Great. Well, that's terrific. Well, uh, you know, this sort of uh, holistic perspective that you're bringing to the table is outstanding. And <coughs> yeah, coming from California where there was a how to a, a free market approach to the cap and trade system, recognizing that here in New York State, there needs to be some sort of I believe carbon pricing tool to underpin a lot of the activity or something to that effect, but it'd be great to, to continue to talk about that with the CLCPA. Okay, and so next we are then gonna hear uh, from Will, who uh, I believe grew up in the area as I was uh, gathering over there in our conversation and is in Arizona. He's gonna talk about solar power. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an honor to be here. I grew up uh, I grew up in Batavia, I graduated from Batavia High in 2006. Um, and I thought as part of this, I might have uh, Maybe the easiest thing to talk about being that I work in solar right now. So a lot of people hear solar, you get to see solar all around you. Um, so I thought about talking as my elevator pitch about my kind of journey to how I got here um, and kind of the interesting thing that I've seen in solar in the last 10 years that I was. So when I left Batavia, I joined the Navy and was working on a nuclear program. Um, and then after getting out of that, I, uh, I got into the solar industry about 2012. And it was pretty much in its infancy, um, working for one of the biggest companies at that time. And what was, what was interesting about that is, so obviously renewables, everybody knows that's kind of the alternative to the fossil fuel, coal and, and natural gas. And working in the commercial scale, utility scale space, 
at that time, when I first got in, we were producing or we were generating building plants at about five gigawatts a year-ish. And for everybody that doesn't know what a gigawatt or can't picture what a gigawatt is, so one megawatt is about three to five acres of land worth of solar panels, and, or that produces about 160 houses. It can power about 160 houses. Obviously, for one megawatt, there's a thousand megawatts in a gigawatt. Um, so we have now 4x, 5x um, the amount of production, and, and it's only growing um, in just the 10 years that I've been in this space. Um, and, and that total that we're now up to is about 121 uh, gigawatt hours, which is about 23.3 million households that we can now power in the U.S. alone uh, with solar power. So it, it's pretty exciting. <coughs> um, it's been an exciting journey for me, and I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to talk more on the panel, but um, that's all I have. Great, great, welcome back. Yeah. You're doing amazing things. Okay, wonderful. So now we're just gonna kind of open up a, kind of a conversation up here, and then I think eventually we will turn it to you to ask questions of, of some of the panelists. Uh, so why don't we just start with more of a general question. You know, there's the CLCPA, the climate bill, we'll call it, <laughs> to make it simple. So it's this really ambitious policy. Let's get to net zero electricity by, uh, I believe, 2040 and 85% reduction of total emissions relative to 1990 levels by 2050. So this is, this is a Herculean task in front of us. And we know there's global ambitions that map onto this through the Paris Agreement. So within that context, I'm wondering if I could just hear from each of you or you know, whoever wants to jump in here. This is, a, this is a tough question, but why not start? What is the single biggest barrier that you see in your industry to meeting sustainability goals. And, and I wanna leave it wide open. Of course, we could talk about economics or uh, labor or whatever, jobs. I mean, but I would just like to open that up. And uh, can I put you on the spot back there? I guess Still so. to start with? Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll start with the hometown kid here. All right. Great. So I, I think uh, in the news, you probably heard a lot lately about obviously supply chain issues across the industries. Um, solar has been not immune to that. Um, but the big thing that's hit solar recently in the last year or so has been trade tariffs with China and, and other countries like that. Um, and that's that's really caused, so um, for those that don't know, we uh, most of our PV panels come from China. Um, there's a few other sources. Um, but trade tariffs that put that on not only raise prices, but they also are hurting you know our ability to even get panels in. So right now, we have projects in construction that have been delayed four or five months just because we can't get the panels to do them. Um, they're also seeing, you know, the prices, I think the latest I heard was about 15% it's raised prices because of the trade tariffs. Um, and so, you know, not only are the tariffs hurting us, but then the supply chain issues, driver shortages, things like that, again, not immune to that. And I think overcoming it as an industry, you know, we really look at long term, is there ways to get, you know, those sources or build the modules locally and get the raw materials locally or within the U.S. or within our trade partners um, you know, either in Canada, Mexico, or other trade partners. Uh, but then short term, uh, you know, our industry is looking at other non-Chinese manufacturers in India, Malaysia, mm -hmm. Thailand. Um, and there's some problems with tariffs that right now and the legislation, but um, it's finding alternative sources and being able to really source not, not through just China. That's a good question. Great. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, open that question up. Anyone else want to jump in? talk about barriers as well as, as opportunities to overcome those barriers. So we've heard about that this is a globally connected system and supply chains yeah, and everything yeah, else yeah. Hit, hit our industry. Go, Dan, you got something to say about that? Yeah, so I guess, Great. you know, at Plug Power, we really support all of the uh, kind of really aggressive targets that are out there. I think it's really important that we set those targets and then we really kind of take action because as Peter said, now is the time. It's time for us to act. You know, we've talked about it, we've studied the whole issue. We really have a lot of data that indicates it is an issue. And in my mind, the critical thing now is we need to start to take action. So at Plug Power, we're moving aggressively to really locally produce green hydrogen from the available resources that are there. Here in, here in, Roch or here in uh, this area, we've located a hydrogen generation plant out at the Stamp location, where we take the green electricity from Niagara Falls and turn it into hydrogen. And we can use that hydrogen in lots of different applications. Mm. Uh, that hydrogen is uh, produced with a electrolyzer that splits the water apart when you put the electricity into it, and it makes green hydrogen. That electrolyzer will be produced right at the Gigafactory in Rochester, New York. 
And so we're adding a whole bunch of jobs there in order to be able to bring this green technology locally. And we ho hope to make 40 tons of hydrogen by the end of next year at the stamp facility to use all across the Northeast. And we are expanding our hydrogen network across the entire United States at all of our Walmart, Amazon sites. You can now go and fill up vehicles there. Um, so the hydrogen infrastructure is slowly being solved with places just like the stamp facility to make the hydrogen locally uh, and, and distribute it uh, to the area. So I think it's really the time is the issue and plug power is aggressively moving forward to make hydrogen ubiquitous across the United States. Great, so. great. If I could follow up really quick, so, so this idea that there's uh, a lot of jobs that are being created right now through this new hydrogen economy. Can you talk, so we have a lot of students in the room, is there something you could say about the kind of training that's useful to think about getting involved in hydrogen? Yeah, I think we're very fortunate here. We've got opportunities. I've got 100 openings at my plant in Rochester, and I've got 50 openings at the plant in, at the stamp facility. And they range from everything from uh, assemblers all the way up to electrochemists, to industrial engineers, to mechanical engineers, and to electrochemists. So I have openings all across uh, the way. We started out with probably about 40 employees in Rochester. And uh, now I'm up to a little over 200 employees and growing. I've got 100 openings yet to fill this year. And we're working very closely with universities on co-op programs, working at the uh, educational levels, be able to educate folks on hydrogen, how to work with it, how to use it safely, how to work with high power. So all those things are really in the works. And we've got a bunch of feeder programs coming up so that we'll be able to have um, students that come out of college want to come and work locally here in green technology. So if you're looking for a job, let me know. We're happy to, happy to work with you and get you uh, employed. So thank you. Great. There you go. Anyone want a job in hydrogen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to school and do that. We have that jobs at the winery, too. And, okay, well, hey, I don't want to, yeah, sorry. Do you want a job at the winery? Come talk to me after. Come talk to, to Sue here. Uh, Suzanne, so... Let's, let's continue that question, but maybe you can, you, you know, you have experience in the CLCPA. You're kind of involved in the, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're learning in that uh, and, or sure, anything sure, else, sure. but I think yeah. it'd be really interesting to, to engage in what does that process really look like? Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's an inherent tension always between moving quickly and efficiently and moving slower and being more inclusive and building consensus and mm -hmm. bringing everyone along. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone who's been involved has been, um, comes from very different backgrounds, very different experiences um, in different parts of the states, different industries, different sectors. Um, and we've come together, all a volunteer on top of our day job or jobs, um, to build consensus around how we create a roadmap to get New York from the current economy to a totally transformed cli climate friendly economy. Um, and so it's been quite a process. I think, um, you know, the, the, the strength in it is that, that folks have been really engaged and people are having to really come together and, and hash through these things. The weakness is there isn't a funding source, there isn't enough staff at the agencies, so that they're also doing this on top of their regular jobs. So we do have to, fi we, have to f we have some fixes to make to, to, um, to make it more effective. But I think the broader contextual challenge that we haven't yet wrestled with mm. in this is that, you know, and bear with me while I use a train analogy, but I think it's helpful. <laughs> You know, basically, we, we are, our economy is going down the tracks on an old, stinky, polluting, slow train. We, are built, we have to build a new, clean, fast train. We have to get everyone from the old train to the new train safely. They're moving at different speeds. We haven't built the train yet or the track so fully yet, so we can't get everyone over. So you have to maintain and continue running the old train um, at the same time. And so, you know, a lot of folks are really, really excited about the new train. Um, and they're, you know, and sort of, you know, the old train is polluting and we don't like the old train, mm -hmm. but we still have to deal with it. It is the current economy and the, e the infrastructure that we have. So the, the challenge is doing both without, without putting the burdens of the cost of the old system mm -hmm. onto the poorest who have the least ability to pay. So the, the kind of focus on, we have to shift again from like all the little what's of the new design of the train over to the, the kind of like how do we get there and how do we do it all together with everyone, bringing everyone on board. And that's the real, the real challenge and the real grace in this. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a powerful analogy. And uh, you know, thinking like the way, what you just painted there, is there a challenge more worthy of the United States innovation? you know, to step into a problem that big 
can take it on. I mean, it's just, it is enormous when we have to think about the just transitions for our fossil fuel economy, um, which Peter was talking about too. So it, it's a big issue. A lot of things to sort out. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, shift that question Dairy Producer Association Pro Dairy. Uh, at Cornell, we have a, a thousand cows. When I became dean, I was told you have a thousand cows. <laughs> uh, you have to start thinking about. Luckily, my uh, family history is in dairy, so I wasn't too freaked out by that. But we're now leading um, net zero dairy operations at Cornell. There's these respiration chambers that are going in uh, that are a partnership with Cargill. So we'll be the only institution in the country that can measure emissions from the cows and how they belch methane and how you can reduce that through feed alternatives. So all that being said, when we think about dairy as an opportunity for the future, what, do, what are you thinking about as barriers and opportunities within that context? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, very good. Good question. So um, I, think, uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the barriers and opportunities is education. Mm -hmm. um, not saying that because I worked at Cornell for 20 years and that was part of my role. Um, I'm saying it because it's what I, what I see and what I believe and I know that knows is the case. So um, as we've been sitting up here passing the mic past me and thinking about this question and then the modification of it, I found myself thinking back to uh, when President uh, Obama gave his first State of the Union address and uh, he talked about uh, reducing greenhouse gases in this country. He talked about um, renewable energy, and he gave examples of that. He said solar, hydro, geothermal. Did he ever say biomass? No, he never said biomass. Um, of course, I was, my ears were very pinned in listening, right, to him, because I worked in anaerobic digestion for over 20 years at Cornell. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe he didn't say because he didn't know about it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think education, too, when I think about my work with some of the state agencies, and I, I sort of said to myself, well, we can't work in silos here. The dairy industry is diverse. Um, and I think about my, um, I hope I don't get teary-eyed here, the lady I worked for uh, growing up, Marcia Smith, who said, dairy farmers, Kurt, you need to know all the things we need to do to run this farm. I'm here, I'm a you know, young, young, young kid. We have to be HR people. We have to be dairy people. We have to be pseudo veterinarians. We have to be feed people. We have to understand timing. We have to understand soils, crops, seeds. I mean, the list just goes on and on, right, John? It just goes on and on what a dairy farmer has to understand. And so when I think about that, um, we need to make solutions for uh, dairy solutions in this whole area of climate change needs to be on a holistic perspective. And so I, you, I hear, I heard a lot from uh, my time at Cornell, well, digesters don't get really get a lot of attention because they really can't contribute to very meaningfully to the renewable energy portfolio of New York State. And I would say, well, maybe not, maybe not. But dairy farmers are price takers. If they can diver diversify and a digester can help them um, not only bring in a, a, a separate you know, stream of money that they maybe could control the price of it a little bit and, and not be a price taker on that. And they also could work with society to co-digest um, organics that are, that are um, uh, landfilled otherwise um, and recover those nutrients and think whole system-wise and not just think about energy. Um, that's where we need to be. And what I say is that takes education, can, more education than I was able to, to have impact on. To, to get that message out and get action in that space. If you think about um, a digester, there's a, uh, or any renewable energy, any renewable energy, there's something called a capacity factor. Um, capacity factor for solar in Arizona is much higher than in New York State, correct? Right. So um, if, 
if we think about capacity factor for digesters that create renewable natural or energy, renewable energy every minute of every day, the capacity factor of a digester is five times that of solar in New York State. So that is, should be value to society because we can continuously produce energy. So if you want electricity for hydrogen, think about farms with digesters because that gas is coming out all the time and as engines can run constantly up to a capacity factor of 0.96, which if you think about it, that's 96 or 96% 96 of the time they're running at full speed, which is tremendous. So that's my educational speech on this. Wow. Okay, that was, that was amazing, thank you. I think Su Suzanne had something she I, wanted yeah, to I jump would, in on here. I would just tag on to that, that, that um, anaerobic digesters can uh, also, are also used for to digest food waste. Mm -hmm. um, so in this theme of everything being connected, um, t almost 20% of all the material going to landfills in New York is food waste. Um, and that food waste can, contains a huge amount of energy and nu nutrients that we could recapture if we could recycle all of that food waste. Of course, we have to reduce it, but there's still banana peels and pits and seeds. There's just always a certain level of food waste that we could be um, capturing composting and then also digesting. Not all food waste can be composted. Um, uh, digesters that, that generate owns get 18 wheeler load after 18 wheeler load of expired sodas yogurt sodas john noble's digester if you want to hear about his and we have these high-tech depackaging units that take all the food out of the containers digest it recapture the nutrients and there's a fertilizer crisis building in the world now so the war in ukraine is affecting fertilizer and energy so you know all of this is connected and so it's not just about the energy, it's not just about dairy, it, there's also food waste, there's fertilizer, there's energy, there's the amount of energy and the time of day. So um, for the students, um, don't go too narrow in your studies. Make sure you get a little bit of a, a, a balanced diet in your study so that you can see the connectivity and really optimize across the systems. Great, terrific. Okay, so let's, let's shift the question a little bit. I'm gonna go back to, to Will and uh, so working in renewables, and we've been hearing a little bit about sort of circular systems in agriculture and what that can do to benefit uh, energy production and maybe even hydrogen. What, what would you say is the outlook for renewables from your perspective as, as we look into the future? And uh, you talked about some of the barriers that we're experiencing today, but what's the kind of, what's the kind of outlook you would have? Yeah, I'm, I talked a little bit about it, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. So um, when I was looking up stats for this, um, obviously I don't deal with that in my day to day every day, but. Um, I was looking up stats to give to you. I'll, I, I found out that 46% of new energy being built right now is, is solar, which is, mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was looking at projections for 2023, 2024, and uh, it was only going up. So as long as, you know, I talked about tariffs, it, it, tariffs could have a, a big swing on that. They, they could stymie that growth, but um, I, I, I threw a number at 23.6. The projections for 2024 were 25, 26 gigawatt hours, or gigawatts. Um, so it's uh, it's it's only going up, I think, in my my experience. Yeah. I would, yeah. So when I first got, again, talking about my journey, when I first got into this industry, um, the price per, per we, we jade, um, always baseline on price per watt. And the price per watt was around 550, 566 when I first got in the industry uh, 10 years ago. Um, so to put that in scale, it's now around a, a dollar, dollar fifty. Um, so to put that in scale to a one megawatt site, um, you know, two megawatt site that's right out there. Um, what used to cost around five, six million dollars to build now cost one to two million dollars to build, one, one and a half million dollars to build. So, so obviously that's a big swing in the ability for, you know, not just California or Arizona and the capacity factor that he talked about to make it viable because you could do it in California back then at six dollars um, to now making it viable and economically viable in New York because it is cheap um, or cheaper to do. So did you say, did I catch that? You said 500 down to? Uh, five to one. Five, five to and one. a half to one, yeah. Wow, that's a big Ten change. Ten years, yeah. Great, well, yeah, you can see why the outlook is good and promising. <laughs> it is. And uh, there's a lot of employment opportunity in solar, too. I think it's one of the fastest growing employers. It is, yeah. yeah. 
Great. Okay. Um, so let's go back to uh, to Dan here. Dan, you know, I, I would love to hear your broader perspective on this hydrogen economy you're talking about. You mentioned you're working with forklifts, but you can you can do a lot of things with hydrogen. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about maybe even the differences between green and blue hydrogen and where the hydrogen comes from. Well, we'd yeah. love to hear more from that. Yeah. Great. I think. You made a great point as electricity costs come down and, and you saw from Peter's charts that all of the cost of renewable electricity has really come down. As you get down to about three cents a kilowatt hour of electricity, uh, you really can make inexpensive hydrogen. And if you think about hydrogen as a kilogram of hydrogen has about equivalent energy of a gallon of gasoline. So with three cents electricity, we can now get down to about three dollars a kilogram of the cost of the hydrogen. So now I have this very inexpensive hydrogen, which can compete with other energy sources like natural gas or with gasoline <clears throat> at a cost basis because of that cheap electricity. Now if I can get that same cheap electricity from a renewable source, I can now make what's termed green hydrogen. Uh, you have all lots of different kinds of hydrogen. You have pink hydrogen that comes from nuclear because you use the electricity from nuclear. There's uh, blue and then there's uh, kind of a gray hydrogen, lots of different things, but really the focus these days is all on green hydrogen. If you can make it from renewable electricity, you can have green, uh, green um, hydrogen, which is really what all of our customers are really demanding, is to move in that direction. So when you talk about the next steps is what do you do with all that green hydrogen once you have it available, not only can you use it for forklifts, but then start to use it in larger vehicles for transporting uh, the hydrogen around in a tube trailer. Um, you can also use it for the, aeros the aerospace industry. Really there's a lot of movement to kind of decarbonize the aviation industry, not only from the airports, from the tugs at the airports, but the transport around the airports, moving the planes around on the tarmac, and then actually flying the planes. In fact, next month we've had a very close association with Airbus. We plan to take our first flight on a hydrogen powered airplane that at the commuter level uh, to be able to take that first flight where we use hydrogen as the fuel, liquid hydrogen, and we convert it into electricity that runs the motors or the fan blades on the plane uh, mm -hmm. through an, a fuel cell. So we're really wow. excited about that. That I don't want to be the first one on that flight, but I think shortly, <laughs> okay. shortly after that, we'll be able to perfect that technology to be able to make it uh, for short commuter flights. Um, I think we're pretty excited about that opportunity going forward. And there's a lot of other ones. We, we use hydrogen to, to hydrogenate our food. We use hydrogen for uh, the chip industry. Uh, we use actually hydrogen to decarb or to desulfurize our gasoline. So there's a lot of applications for hydrogen out there once you can make it at low cost and make it renewable. Great, great. And tractors. And tractors. <laughs> tractors. Yep. Wow, wow, well, you know, other than uh, that, that lack of endorsement for getting on the first plane. Uh, it sounds really exciting. <laughs> we'll figure out who's going to be that first uh, person, but we can put robots on it or something. Test, test pilots. Test pilots. Okay, there That's we go. what everyone said about renewable jet fuel on the oh, first yeah. two flights, and now they're, they're quite common. Now it's like widespread. Okay, great. Uh, so let me turn back to, to Kurt again. So you were talking passionately about dairy production, and New York State's the fourth largest dairy producer in the country right. and continues to have a robust dairy uh, sector. I'm curious what factors you think should be considered in dairy specifically uh, as we work on the notion of food sustainability. So um, we all need to eat, right? Um, and uh, we know that dairy, that milk is good for us. Milk products taste good. Um, and um, we need to think about the, the nutritional value of those products uh, relative to the uh, footprint they have. And so I mentioned earlier U.S. dairy industry um, um, has an ambitious goal, right, to be greenhouse gas net zero or better by 2050. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot to get there that, that's very ambitious. Um, so that's an absolute massive emissions goal. But if you think about normalizing those emissions on a value of a food standpoint, that really hasn't been done yet. 
what is done now is uh, the sort of the internal barometer, if you would, is uh, the uh, CO2, CO2 equivalent. So that's a way of expressing greenhouse gas emissions based on their global warming potential altogether into one unit, normalizing it, if you would. CO2E per unit of energy corrected milk. Well, what's energy corrected milk? That's basically the, the uh, milk volume that's corrected for the concentration of, of um, fat and protein in it. So um, we think about that from a standpoint of uh, an efficiency basis. But a step past that would be is what's the nutritional value for us, for kids, um, the key amino acids that are in milk that are very, very unique to milk and things like that compared to other sources of food that don't necessarily have them or maybe have them at that concentration and what's their footprint to provide those key and nutri microgredient nutrients. Mm -hmm. So I think, I don't know if that's really the question yeah, you asked absolutely. me, but that's yeah. where this is, go this, is, this is where this is going. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that, so that idea of nutritional value over its footprint and thinking about holistically right. and, and how to drive that in even better directions with like anaerobic digesters or. Right. Yeah. Right. Great. Right. So, so I think about dairy, you know, was, uh, when I was at DMI, which is the DMI's Dairy Management Incorporated, um, it's the, um, uh, it, so the farmers pay uh, into a national checkoff, that's DMI. Um, it's 15 cents per hundredweight, so farm is, milk, milk is counted in hundredweights, not in gallons, in hundredweights in the industry. You buy it as gallons or partial parts of a gallon. But uh, so money goes to DMI, and um, so uh, we think about the, or, you know, um, the environmental side of dairy, and I forgot my point. Um, what was your, oh, digestion, right? Yeah, yeah digestion. digestion. Yep. And um, um, what it really, so the UN had a food system summit um, uh, two parts. One, the first part was uh, in Rome, I believe, in August of last year, and then they had another part two was in New York City, uh, I believe it was in September and uh, last year. And so one of the things I uh, had the opportunity to do is review some of the, the uh, draft papers for that summit. And what I learned about then and overseas, because most of this stuff was prepared overseas, is about the ultimate circular economy. Mm -hmm. And dairy, I said dairy, is exemplifies itself as the ultimate circular economy when it comes to mm -hmm. protein-based foods from, um, from animals. So we need, to, we need to kind of, the dairy industry needs to work on uh, uh, that and getting that out there and really defining that for themselves. Great, that's terrific. Okay, thanks. And so one more question, we'll turn it over to Susan and then we'll, we'll pivot to the audience here so we can hear from you. Uh, so lessons learned from building a sustainable winery that might, that might even translate to other sectors, whether it's other ag sectors or just other industries that are trying to approach decarbonization strategies. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's a very broad question, but I'm sure you would have a number of things to say about that. Yeah. Well, f full credit where it's due. It's, it's been a whole family effort. Uh, my dad spearheaded the geothermal project. My brother spearheads the compost. I spearheaded the solar. So it, it, it's a team effort. I think, you know, in terms of a concrete recommendation that I would make mm -hmm. is that you know, having been back for seven years now and been back, you know, I grew up on the farm in the, you know, with the wine winery on the, on the property, and it is a full on, like farming is full on, producing food and beverages, it just takes every ounce of your energy. And so then I'm an expert in all these other technologies and all these other strategies and, you know, reviewing 8,000 documents is not something that, that anyone in agriculture or, or wine production has time for. So I think, I, I think that, that um, there should be more public money um, to pay for the major ag associations, the Wine and Grape Foundation, to have full-time staff that can be there as a full-time resource to be expert in all of the solar uh, funding, all of the geothermal rebates and opportunities, all the latest in the soil carbon science, and so that every single farmer and business owner doesn't have to become an expert and do it themselves. Because mm. um, it's just, there's only so many hours in the day, and there's the core business that of, the, of the farm or the business that has to get done. So that would be one, one thought. Um, you know, uh, other lessons learned, I mean, it's always hard to be the first. Um, mm. Uh, and so, you know, we sort of pride ourselves on making them make mistakes and letting others learn from, from them. 
we had a, a little demonstration wind turbine, just a little one that never worked very well, but now it's an awesome perch for our raptors that, that eat all the mice. So, you know, everything has another use. Um, I think, you know, one lesson learned would be it, it, it's helpful to work together as a team. I think, you know, we got together with neighbors and peers in the wine industry and um, did some of the work together. I think um, it's, now see, I'm, now it's catching. Now I'm gonna lose my train of thought as well. <laughs> um, very early morning today. Um, yeah, there's, gosh, there's so many. I think mm -hmm. there's so many uh, individuals in, in the wine industry and in, in agriculture that a lot of, uh, we have to kind of, to, to torture the train analogy again, you know, we have to demonstrate that the new train works and that, you know, before people wanna jump on, on board. So a lot, we need a lot more demonstration that so people can mm -hmm. kick the tires. Um, yeah, I could rattle on about yeah. this for a long time over a bottle of wine, no, but I'll stop there. That was terrific. Well, uh, so so we're gonna turn it back, but I, I think you know this train analogy. Of course, let's hope it's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? <laughs> Here, this is what we're looking at as we're as we're getting onto this other train, and it's driven by electrical power and or hydrogen and all that. The stuff. old train goes over yeah. a cliff. Yeah. The new and train okay. goes yeah. somewhere yeah. beautiful. And we take all the passengers and we bring them onto the new train. This this sounds this sounds like a great great way to do it. So I, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I've been up here <laughs> learning a lot. You know, obviously these challenges are significant and we've heard here from our panelists so many different ways in which we are already making progress and we need to do a lot more. Uh, one thing I like to say about climate is you can certainly do too little, but at this point you can't do too much. Okay, but we do have to celebrate the successes at each step along the way and recognize that we have so many young innovators, I think, in this room here. And this isn't to say, hey, figure it out. No, no, we're gonna help as best we can, and you're gonna step into that space and do even more. And I think that's, that's the opportunity that we see in front of us. So consider all these options, and as, as Peter pointed out, you know, he had these four mindful principles. You know, it sounds like a lot of what Suzanne was talking about was like, how do you share information? How do you do it in a mindful way? How do you demonstrate? How do you fail fast? That's okay, and then you succeed quicker. I mean, these are all fundamental attributes of the innovation we need to conduct together. So thanks so much for being so attentive, and now it's your time to, to talk to the panelists and ask questions, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jay, who's going to be moderating that. Okay, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, well, thank also, you. The, there's a microphone right in the middle. For those yeah. Who can be heard, uh, to engage. And so now, literally, the floor is yours. So great. Please step up before we uh, get ready to do the next part of our program. Great, great. Yeah, step up. Uh, don't be shy. You know, ask a question, whatever you're thinking about. Maybe it's even a question about what you can do to make a difference or something you've heard today that you're not quite certain about. You know, we had a great set of polls that kind of move people into different categories. So yeah, please go sure, ahead. Sure, I've got a question, and, and it's for the panel and maybe you, yourself, Dean. So <clears throat> what I'm seeing in New York you know, is we're, we're seeing a lot of our prime farmland mm. go to solar, yeah. right? So how do, we, how do we handle that? Is there a better place, like more marginal land or buildings? What's your thoughts on that? Well, it's a terrific question. Before I answer, let's, let's go to our experts over here. I have my own perspective on that with some programs we're leading on behalf of the state right now as the land grant, but I would love to hear from the practitioners what, yeah. what their thoughts are. Go ahead. I, I think that's a good question, one we hear a lot in the solar industry. Um, so it, it, kind of twofold. So I have a lot of plants. Um, my community solar plants that I manage are in the Hudson Valley, New York area, Massachusetts, Minnesota. We have a lot of those plants on land that was couldn't be farmed, so it was stone quarries, it was landfills, it was things like that. Um, those are becoming ever more popular. Um, and then I have a story that always kind of touches me um, that I got from a nephew of a farm owner uh, that uh, I went and visited on one of our community solar's active project. And uh, this farm had been in their family for generations. It was, I think he told me, 200 years, 150 years. And the price of hay had gone down so much that it, it started being not cost competitive to do hay. And so he took a portion of his land and turned it into solar. And so he had long-term benefits of a payment from our, us leasing the land to help him sustain the other part of his farming. And then he also told me that he had eight kids and after he died, he was afraid that they were gonna sell the farm on him. 
And so by putting solar there, it now gave them a payment that made them want to keep the farm. So I, I think there's a lot of benefits. And, and yes, it does take up some land, but there, there's ways to use land that, that wasn't able to be farmed and then also provide benefits to the farmers on portions of the land that they, uh, they, can, they can spare, I guess. Great, great, thanks. Anyone else want to jump in on that quick? Yeah, I would just say this is another example of where, where people, like we have to have a lot of engagement and a lot of discussion. And, and there are some examples of solar developers coming into areas and um, the community um, like actually spending a lot of time discussing, well, could you put, could you, could you put um, trees along the road so we, you know, there isn't, you know, then they work out all these things and could we get this much in taxes from the project? And, and then the community warms up to it and they benefit. And then, and, and there, so there's, and then you see examples where the, it doesn't go that it does not go well so i i think um and i think we have to be very thoughtful as this region becomes more important as a food supplier as parts of california and the southwest um, have more and more severe water shortages new york is going to become ever more important as a food supplier so we have to protect our prime farmland so i think it's just all about being thoughtful about getting educated yourself and being thoughtfully engaged i think um, some of the pitched battles could really would really <laughs> Um, we'd all d we'd all have better outcomes if, if folks would work better at um, at dialogue versus sort of lobbing grenades, um, and then there's also agrivoltaics. So I think there's also using the same piece of land um, for for agriculture and for solar production, and I think the ideal case scenario is it, are those scenarios because it's really hard to be a farmer. Almost all of us have off farm income. I'm a prime <laughs> example to be able to afford, you know, where there's huge volatility in markets, in consumer preferences, in the weather. So if you have a steady payment from your renewable energy system that you know is coming in, that is so huge in helping to build resilience in farming and allow the next generation to stay in farming. So I think there are ways to do it thoughtfully and there are ways to do it poorly and we should go <laughs> the, the prior route. Yeah, I love, I love that idea of the, of the multiple benefits and doing it thoughtfully. And you know, at Cornell, we're doing some work on agrovoltaics where we do sheep grazing with the solar panels and it provides shade for the animals. The, the animals then can help boost carbon in the soil as they graze moderately through the system. And it's that kind of array that we really need to think closely about as we you know, are gonna continue to face extreme weather and food production is gonna be challenging in some areas. And what we're seeing in Ukraine right now is a collapse of the wheat market. Okay, so we really have to think holistically, but we can't lose our, our farms in favor of energy. That is not the right trade-off. Yeah, and I would just Go say ahead. we also yeah. don't want to lose them to development because solar yep. panels can be removed fairly readily and housing mm. tracks and strip malls can't. Yeah. Like that farmland is gone. So there's that balance as well. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, question. Okay, so you've talked about shifting to clean energy and acting locally. So my question is, do you think it's realistic to implement electric school buses in rural communities and what do you think are the biggest challenges in that aspect? Jake, you go for that one? Great. Yeah, I'll jump in. <clears throat> I think the opportunity to use alternate fuels for lots of different things is really coming on strong. And in the case of a school bus, you, you could do it with batteries because they have a very short runs and usually come back to the central source. Or you could do it with hydrogen as the fuel. So there's a lot of opportunity there to take the the transportation of students out of the environmental debate altogether. So I think that's all coming. But the key is, again, getting low-cost fuels available, either electricity or, or hydrogen available. But I think as soon as all, all those um, all the low-cost fuel comes available, that's a great application. So. Great. Okay. Hot, off, hot off the presses, New York State just, someone knows the numbers better than me, I'm sure, but New York State in our budget just recently committed to all electric school bus purchases starting in 2027, 20, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's coming, yeah. Great, and a lot of benefits for air quality. I mean, that's another thing that we don't think about all the time, but one in six people worldwide uh, die prematurely from bad air. And as you electrify, you can save a lot of lives. So that's another co-benefit that we think a lot about. Yeah, go ahead. This question addresses something Ben said. Why do you think it's useful to say things like, all corners of society need to take action, when one out of five people in New York State live in poverty? And as we saw in Peter's talk, it is the richest people in our society that have created the climate crisis and have the resources to address it. Yeah, great, great. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll open that to the panel. But what I think, 
Uh, what I would say by that is we all need to feel empowered, but we also have to recognize the importance of what we call a just transition. And that, uh, as Peter pointed out, you know, uh, greenhouse gases have come almost exclusively from the global north. And uh, when I go to sub-Saharan Africa and work with farmers there, you know, I am seeing the devastating impacts. Uh, whether you don't have resilience, uh, there's lack of uh, energy resources, there's lack of, uh, you know, green technologies for food production, and it's incredibly devastating. So I think there's all, we can answer that, that question in a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of what I mean is that I want, uh, especially those who are up and coming in their careers, to feel inspired to start businesses. You know, one, if, you, if you look at the amount of carbon in the air, uh, not only do we have to hit net zero according to the, the models, but to avoid the most devastating impacts of climate, we have to go to net negative. And we have to do that at billions of tons per year. So you can say, well, how much, how much could that carbon be worth? Uh, current pricing points would say about $100 per ton of CO2 based on the cost on society. And now you, you say, well, how much carbon do we need to extract? Well, around 300 billion tons. So add that together. <laughs> that is a huge new economy. And it was uh, some recent economists came together and said, hey, if you look at our world, where we're going with green technology, with carbon, uh, with the opportunity to solve climate, it's going to be the equivalent of six Amazon-sized businesses developing in the next 40 years out of this challenge. So we have to do that in a way that uh, promotes equity and justice and access for all to that new economy, and we have to think about protecting those who are most vulnerable, who don't have access to resources. I think both are part of it. So I would love to hear if there's any other perspectives on this question of like everyone coming together and how we deal with those who are being most heavily, you know, like you point out, in New York State alone, we're being hit really hard by, by climate uh, and, other, and other issues. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on a point that Kurt mentioned earlier in a little bit different way, but I, I think it's everybody in education. So um, I, I think even if you, you know, who's polluting or who's, you know, the most, the worst of greenhouse gas emitters, everybody can get more educated and help the process. So. The th biggest thing that we see in solar is kind of a lack of education. Even my mom made a comment this morning about solar and how, you know, when it's cloudy out like it is today, mm -hmm. you know, you can't produce. And, and that's not true. You don't produce as much, but you can still produce power. Um, there's been big advancements in um, battery storage. There's been, you know, significant cost decreases. There's ways that, you know, I don't want to put solar on my house or I can't afford it or whatever that you can mm -hmm. get into community solar programs. And so, you know, it's, it's debunking the myths that, that surround the renewable energy industry and, and everybody. And that, that was one of the reasons why I was so excited to talk today. Um, it's also, you know, helping and learning about legislation because legislation is ultimately what's going to help us all, you know, be better and be more sustainable. So great. That's I terrific. That. Great. I'm glad your mom asked you a good question this morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I would just add, um, my husband always always says that we have to be able to hold on to, to a couple ideas at the same time. So mm. yes, the majority of the impact is due to the to the well well or off segments of society, but we also at the same time we can't we can't let the idea that it, climate change is someone else's problem continue to pervade kind of the social mm -hmm. conscious. So it's both. It's yes, it's both of those things, and I think. Um, you know, the, the big, the big threat, uh, the big risk we run right now is, is we're going through this economic transformation at the scale of when we went from whale oil to petroleum and a few Rockefellers were made who were just wildly wealthy and then there was everyone else. And we're, we're, we risk having that same thing happen now if we don't spread the benefits more widely. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. Great point. Okay, terrific. Question, yeah. So Mr. McConnell, or Mr. O'Connell, I'm sorry, uh, mentioned that uh, larger companies are working on lowering their greenhouse gas emissions, um, but they're still obviously, like Amazon and Walmart, are still obviously producing such large, uh, lar large amounts of plastic waste. So what are ways that could offset these problems mm. that they're still contributing to? Great. Yeah, I think that's a great question. In, in my opinion, they're all starting to focus on all of those things. So I, I'm very familiar with what they're doing from decarbonizing their delivery systems, 
trying to get the last mile by battery or by fuel cell using forklifts uh, with hydrogen power. So I think they're slowly addressing every one of their issues, starting from the biggest ones and moving down. But I do think plastic is a big issue. They've changed a lot of their packaging. They've gone to lots of different kinds of uh, thinner cardboard, recycled cardboard. So I think they're starting to address all those. They have some pretty big initiatives to address a lot of those things. So I, I think we're, we're supporting them with what we do, and I think they're all headed in the right direction. And so everything that we're doing is making an impact, and they're going to the next, ne level, next level on each item. So. I think it's coming. Great, and, and if you want to <laughs> check out uh, a company that I think is really being taking on an aggressive strategy, you can look at what Microsoft is doing, because not only are they trying to get to net zero, their, their ambition is net negative, and they're putting a lot of money into that area. But uh, yeah, if we have plastics, we have other things, we all need to be thinking about uh, how to reduce our total waste footprint on top of everything else. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you all for uh, taking time to educate us all here. Suzanne, you made a point about you know the mindset that this is somebody else's problem, and it kind of sparked a thought of, we're a bunch of individuals here. We don't have the plants to split water into hydrogen. We don't have acres to donate to solar fields. What would you ask of each of us as individuals to do to help contribute to this? Is it buy wine that has a sustainable stamp on it? Is it to, uh, you know, buy a battery uh, cell phone charger that's solar powered? Is it to go get hydrogen cars in the future? What would you ask of each of us here in the audience? Yeah, such good questions today. I love these questions. I mean, so number one, I would just say, do you know, it's such a daunting challenge and it's so hard. And, and so w we have to bring joy into this or it's just you burn out. And so I would say, the first thing I would say is get together with your favorite people and figure out some cool stuff to do together so you don't have to become expert in hydrogen cars and electric, you know, electric cars and what to eat. And um, so do it with your friends and then um, figure out how you can contribute your personal superpower, whether like you're amazing at programming or you're an amazing artist um, to the climate transition. So bring, bring your superpower to the challenge. Um, but on an individual decision-making um, level, that's, that's a really tricky one because forever everyone's been saying change your light bulb, eat less meat, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all putting the, the impetus on the individual. And what the pandemic has shown us and what um, a lot of people knew but didn't want to say out loud is that these are massive systems challenges. So every one of us does need to take personal action and, and do our part. But we also have to shift the systems or we're not going to get there. We, we all stopped what we were doing for months and months on end when the pandemic started, and the emissions only went down a little bit, and they're going right back up. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing you should do is be get educated and vote for the politicians that will actually be brave and, and make the policy changes that are necessary to do the systems change. Great, oh, great answer. Yeah, and uh, you know, for me, a lot of times it's easy to get dismayed, but I try to focus on one day at a time. You know, set, set a goal for yourself. Um, everybody in this room has a set of talents that they can bring into this conversation. And if you do it one day at a time, it's amazing what happens when you look back over a year at what you're able to accomplish. So I think these ideas of voting, talking to each other, getting educated, empowering yourself, and recognizing that there are systems in place, that individual choice is really not going to bend the carbon curve. That yeah. old train. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Get on that train. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you believe that at a certain point, the damages from global warming is going to be irreversible? And what needs to be done to stop that? Great. Well, I'll talk about tipping points and then we'll turn it over. So, so we, there's this idea that the earth can go into a hothouse state. And that's based on past historical records of CO2 changes that have happened on the planet. And in fact, Carbon dioxide concentrations when the Earth first formed were a million times higher than they are today. Now that, that has been sucked down by rocks that have chewed up the carbon and then tur turned it into limestone. Some of you know about limestone around here. Think of that as carbon that used to be in the air at one time. Uh, so now that carbon is coming up really quickly through human activities. And so we have to think about how to bend that, that carbon curve. But I'll turn it over to, to the set of panelists here, and maybe they can comment on this. One of the things that I'm always faced with is exactly that question, right, is what is it gonna take? Mm -hmm. And I always think it's not this or that, or it's not one single silver bullet. It's gonna take everything, and we have to pro provide all the innovation on all of those technologies. 
digestion, you know, all, uh, hydrogen, we have to look at batteries. I think it's gonna take everything for us to really kind of bend that curve. And it, it, it's easy to, like you say, pawn, pawn it off on somebody else and say, well, the automotive industry is gonna take care of it, or the farming industry is gonna take care of it, or the government's gonna legislate it in. I don't think that's the case. I think it's gonna take everything we have to get there. And we're all gonna have to work on every one of those technologies. We're gonna have to out-innovate this problem from start to finish, and we all have to contribute to that. Through voting, through legislation, you have to really kind of push individuals to, to make a difference. Ride your bike occasionally, right? I mean, everything, every little bit helps. And so in, in my own personal opinion, we have to bring those uh, green technology jobs back, back to the United States, and we have to act um, appropriately at every one of our businesses in order to make a dent in this, and it's gonna take everything. So I, I think it takes everybody. So. Great. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's, it's important not to be afraid of these tipping points. And I could go through a number that we know exist on the planet, where it's the thawing of permafrost, that the rainforests begin to dry up, and then you lose the hyd hydrologic cycle, um, that the ocean currents start to uh, change dramatically and slow down. Um, all these things are possible, okay? But the most important thing is to focus on the solutions and see how quickly we can mobilize those solutions. So we don't, you know, hopefully those tipping points never happen, but they are a possibility in our future. We all need to be aware this is a time of urgent need and action. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, first of all, thanks for all your wonderful knowledge today. It's been great. When President Kennedy asked Von Braun, who was at that time the director of the space program, what will it take to get to the moon? What he said was, the will, the will to do it. So if we all make a decision about something and decide upon it, that gives us the will to do it. What do we think is happening in Genesee County for all of the systems that come together, starting with government, but going right down to our households? Do we really have the will to do this and the mindset to make this happen? Great, great question. I don't know if any of us can answer that fully, but we'll, we'll go for it, yeah. Um, so I would say um, if you look globally and you look over time, there's been a lot of will in a lot of places and then we, it gets overwhelmed by the folks that make money on the current status quo funding misinformation disinformation campaigns mm -hmm. and like crowding the airspace and it, it's it's i mean there are books and books written on this and like enormous amounts of documentation about this isn't some kind of conspiracy this is his historic <laughs> you know this is history we watched the guys who lobbied for the tobacco industry when they finally lost got hired to lobby for for the fossil fuel industry and they've been very successful so we have to have the will to overcome, you know, not just the technology challenges and the financing and policy, but also the, the, that whole dynamic as well. Um, and it's, you know, the moonshot was incredibly complex and it's, an, it's a really wonderful analogy. It's also, it was a singular task with a singular team as opposed to all of these complex systems and all of society being impacted and impacting the challenge. So we have to, um, really kind of share, the, spread that will, you know, instill it in young people. We have to have the young people continue to put the pressure as they did in the COP on the folks in power. So yeah, it has to, we have to really be resolute. And again, I would say like, it, it's all about building community and, and like, in, like strengthening the will as a community. Yeah, great answer. Okay, so we just have a few minutes left and I'm gonna give uh, each of the panelists just final thoughts before we close and uh, have lunch, I think, after this. So uh, why don't we start at the end with, uh, with Will. Any, any final thoughts for the audience? Take home messages. <laughs> I get lucky, number one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about climate change and, uh, and the benefits. And the other thing, and I, it, it's touched at, across the education. Um, the other thing that I want to give a plug to is the the GCC Solar Tech Training Program. Um, I, I talked with the professor.
today. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, round of applause for that. Uh, All right. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to start getting involved in that and helping with that any way I can. Um, you know, I think everybody, it's been a common theme. We're hurting for, for people in the trades, people in, uh, that can help build this and sustainable um, infrastructure. So, and, and we're, again, not immune. Um, solar tech, like you mentioned, is one of the uh, fastest growing. And so we're constantly looking peop for people. And uh, so it's exciting that they're launching it here at GCC. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm excited yeah. to start it, so. That's that's great, and 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 you taught your mom something today too. I did, which is always <laughs> useful. I do the same thing, and my mom still teaches me stuff too. Yeah, it goes both ways. Okay, next. So again, it was uh, great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, when I think, uh, you know, more locally about, you know, in my thoughts here, I've got lots of thoughts, lots of things I could say. We could go on for a long time. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do that so Susan can formulate hers better than mine, I suppose. Um, so I think locally and, you know, the New York State, um, I've had, a, you know, the, the benefit, privilege, honor, and blessed is probably really the right word to, to serve a long time in the dairy industry. And it's, and it's taken me a lot of places um, all across the country and a lot to Europe as well. Um, I was, w w when the uh, prior discussion was going on, I was thinking about my first trip over with Doug Young, who's a notable dairy farmer and leader in, in uh, the United States, but he, he farms uh, just down the road two hours from here in Auburn, New York, outside of Auburn, and he and I flew over to uh, Switzerland to go to a side platform meeting, um, which is a sustainable agricultural initiative worldwide uh, meeting, and this was years ago now. And um, I was uh, very, I just, 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 just learned so much. One of the things I learned is that, that so we had never been there. We didn't know anybody. We were sitting around tables like this at a dairy workshop. And people there 15 years ago were talking about their greenhouse gas footprint to get to that meeting. Wow. That's cool. To get to that meeting. Mm -hmm. And one guy picks up his bicycle that folds up like a briefcase <laughs> and says, by riding my bike, I reduce my greenhouse gas put footprint this much. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, they know what they're, what they're, what's going on. They know their numbers there. And we're still working hard on our numbers here, to quantifying this. And it's a big initiative in the United States, the dairy industry, that I'm working on at uh, Trutera to uh, understand, to quantify a footprint, and then quantify the change to that footprint based on uh, implementations, interventions, and improvements. So it's, it, it's really cool stuff. But, um, you know, we can do all that we want, but the farmers have to be, you know, in on this. And I would say that, again, with all my travels, I could tell you that some of the leading dairy farmers I ever worked with is here in New York State. Yeah. So you have the right attitude um, by folks here, largely in the dairy industry, to continue. Um, if you think back to um, 1998, I came here, um, and it was just on the heels of a lawsuit of a dairy farm in Wyoming County, um, and they were allegedly violating the U.S. Clean Water Act. Um, they, were they were found guilty in the court of law. Um, what came out of that was, well, we need, we need, we need something mm. that's not about point source pollution, but non-source point solution for New York, for, for the United States. So essentially, the, the term CAFO uh, that we, a lot of us know about, uh, confined animal operations, feed operations, they, uh, that came out of the work in New York State to begin with. And the industry came together and worked with the state of New York to come up with CAFO that worked for the state and worked for the dairy farmers and others in the state. And I think that's a, a great tribute to what needs to be done on a lot of other things that involve society, state, and, and the ag industry and dairy in general. So I'm very encouraged. I think the attitude's right here in New York for a lot of advancement. So great. did I give you enough time? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say, because I've said plenty already, I think, I would just say, um, two things. One, um, if there's ever a time to be brave, the time to be brave is now, so that we avoid these irreversible tipping points, as one of our questioners brought up. Um, and also, um, we have so much more to learn, so it's also time to be incredibly humble, because mm -hmm. even if you're the top expert in you know, green widgets, you still have enormous amounts to understand about how that widget connects to another thing. So. So just it is the moment that we have to be the brave 
our bravest self and maintain our most humble self if we're gonna if we're gonna get this work done. Great, great message. So I would say in closing for me it was I would like to say that you know Plug Power believes that green hydrogen has to be part of the decarbonization solution as we go forward. Uh, I also think that globally the situation that we see going on has made it painfully obvious that we we really need to get away from fossil fuels and move toward renewable uh, electricity and renewable green hydrogen. So um, we have to do it now. Uh, and lastly, if you're looking for a job, come see me. <coughs> <laughs> Great, I'll see you after this. No, I'm okay. Uh, well, look, thank you so much, everybody. I think, yes. Oh, me? Oh, final thoughts, okay. <laughs> Well, I, I learned so much here, and, and I would summarize everything, but I would do a bad job of that. So instead, what I'm going to say is uh, what I believe, I'm going to look into the future. And I'm not going to look far. I'm going to look in the next several years. I believe that carbon is going to be a commodity that brings new sources of revenue to farmers in upstate New York. And Cornell is working on that problem right now, and we're already starting to see some progress there. But I think it needs to be all aspects from dairy to soil to all the innovations that can happen. So I'm excited about that future. And I also know that we need what some would refer to as silver buckshot. There is no silver bullet. We're not going to the moon in a rocket. That, that's amazing that that happened, and I'm glad that was brought up. But this is about millions and millions of solutions working in concert across many areas of the planet. So whether it's right here in Genesee, and you're working on the new uh, solar uh, teaching opportunity, which is great, or you're thinking about getting carbon into the soil and making sure you're getting paid for it, all good. Uh, and then the final thing I'll say is, you know, for me a quote I think about every day is uh, one from Nelson Mandela. You know, this is somebody who was imprisoned for 20 years, right, plus, because he was standing up for justice, just to be treated as an equal human in South Africa. And he came out and, and they said, wow, I can't believe you're doing this. And he says, well, you know, for me, everything seems impossible until it's done. So if it seems impossible, that's okay. What doesn't until it's done? Don't let that stop you from taking significant actions because everything seems impossible until it's done. And then you'll look back and someone will say, oh, that was simple. Then you know you've really done something good, okay? So we need to be optimistic, we need to be realistic, and we need to lead with that informed optimism and uh, all the ideas that, that Peter presented earlier uh, to think locally and globally. So thanks so much, that's all I have. We'll turn it back over to you, Jay. That was, that was invaluable, so thank you. <laughs> Round of applause, please, for Ben, Daniel, Will, Suzanne, and Kurt. So now the next phase, which will be libations and lunch, we're going to do this in a semi-organized manner, hopefully. Uh, the, your, number, your tables have numbers. We're going to start with the low numbers and just keep moving down this way, then the next line, and go that way. You're going to go around and back. Everything in your lunch for lunch is in these boxes. Go back to your tables, and then uh, Julie Don Donilon Yates will then start our next program, which will be the facilitation of conversations at your tables. So if we can have tables one to four and our guests, please start. Go that way, around the back, and over and get lunch, please. You need those guys? Because he apparently can, all this controls with stuff there. The guys in the back.
Oh, this is an apple cart. That, that one should fit you. That's a, a, a standard 